Welcome everyone to the Committee of the Whole meeting for Tuesday, September 10th. Uh, just a reminder that this is a Committee of the Whole meeting, so there'll be no decisions made here today. These will just be recommendations that'll go to our next council meeting on September 24th uh, for ratification. So can I get a motion please for the adoption of the agenda? Councillor Elmsley and Vale, all in favor? That's passed. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest on today's agenda? Seeing none, we'll move right into item four, which is deputations. Uh, our first deputation is item 4.1, a request to purchase land adjacent to 1474 Fleetwood Road. Uh, Daryl and Jones, welcome. I'll just remind the deputants they have uh, five minutes, please. There should be a little button there to turn that microphone on if you would. Perfect. Okay, there we go. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is Daryl Jones. I live at 1474 Fleetwood Road, Bethany. I'm here today to ask for help in finding a solution to be able to close my garage permit. I obtained the permit in October uh, 2016. The garage was built by a contracting company and is used for storage uh, primarily for my uh, late husband's 57 Chev. Uh, we used the existing survey for the property at that time, which has the original uh, fence and posts in between um, my property and the vacant land. Uh, I've never, I never even thought about closing the permit at the time. Uh, in February 2019, a new survey was completed, and that was when I was made aware of the garage eaves um, troughs were encroaching um, onto the other property. Uh, so I did contact Realty Services to see if I could purchase the city-owned vacant land and um, that was next to mine um, and I only had heard uh, back from them uh, saying that uh, the response was the committee said no it has to go to public sale. I am the only property that is um, adjoining, uh, abutting that property. Um, in the letter also that I received from Realty Services they asked me to remove the encroaching eaves troughs which I have done and I did submit a picture that that was completed. Then I was asked to go to planning department and apply for a minor variance. I completed the minor variance application and submitted it when I received a letter from David Harding to ask council if they would be willing to convey a 1.4 meter strip of the land uh, to meet prior to listing the vacant land for sale. In conclusion, I would still be more than willing to purchase the adjoining property to solve uh, the encroachment problem. Um, as I am the only property that is uh, abutting it um, for fair market value, I would also be willing to pay the city legal closing costs and um, it would save the city a fair amount of money, including some realtor fees. I do have the, um, the different surveys. I do have all the letters. Um, if, if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you. Um, the council, there is some information in your yellow folders uh, regarding this as well, if you've had a peek. Are there any, uh, I'll get a motion to receive first, um, Councillor Seymour, Fagan and O'Reilly. Are there any questions for the deputant? Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you and thanks for coming out, Daryl. And I've been out at the property and I've checked it out and uh, I, I support what Daryl doing here today. And I was wondering if we can ask uh, our city solicitor if this is something that we can possibly accommodate. Uh, yes, thank you. The, um, the city disposition bylaw, the default is for an open market sale, uh, but with a council resolution, we can do a direct sale for appraised costs plus all costs of the transfer, uh, which the deputant mentioned. So there's a, a staff fee, uh, reference, uh, sorry, survey fee, appraisal fee. And so that is something that um, Land Management Committee has entertained in the past with, um, you might recall, a property on Logie Street, as well as two properties on Elgin for consistency because council at that time said, notwithstanding uh, the interests of uh, identified parties in the property, that the highest uh, value would be best for the city, and thus we should do um, open market sale. Based on consistency, uh, land management suggested that we should do open market, but we definitely can do, with council resolution, a direct sale. Thank you. Good. Okay. Councillor Almsley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the deputy. Uh, you said something about conveying a 1.5 meter strip. 
That was the suggestion from David Hardy and to satisfy. Would, would, would that solve your immediate problem? It would solve the immediate. And if we conveyed the 1.5 meter strip and then put the property up for sale on the open market, you wouldn't have a problem with that? That would be your call. <laughs> <laughs> then I'd Ask still have to first. go after it, but I'm trust, try, I, you know, it would just resolve things, plus it would save the city some money as well, because I'm willing to pay for the extra costs. Thank you. Okay. I think by having a conversation with the deputant, uh, she's willing to pay the one, sever off the 1.4 meter, but is willing to buy the whole lot on a direct sale. If it goes to market, there's no guarantee she's going to get it when it goes to bid. So by paying the closing costs and the market value, we're, we can certainly give a direct sale, sell the whole lot, and, and it's, it's looked after. So I think it's, it's, a, it's easier for the city, it's cheaper for the city, and it gives the deputant what she's looking for. It's just you're giving her the whole lot on a direct sale as opposed to going to open market. So that's really what the issue is. Thank you. I, my reasoning was that if we solve the immediate problem, then we could still go to the open market uh, Ms. Jones still has the option to purchase it on the open market, but her, immediately, her immediate problem is resolved. And that was my only rationale. And it was a good one. Um, are there any other questions for the deputant? We've got a motion to receive. Councillor Yo. Or for staff. Yeah, just regarding the, because we don't have a report on the agenda, so. Um, yeah, um, through you to staff. Has there been interest from other parties about this piece of property that you know of? Not that I'm aware of, but we haven't advertised it for sale. Okay, so we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Is there a follow-up motion? Councillor Richardson, did you want to put a follow-up or? No? Okay. Any follow-up motion? Councillor Elmsley? Direction for staff? Uh, that this come to the council meeting of uh, September 24th. September yep. 24th for consideration. Yeah. That what come forward? The motion to receive? Uh, the motion to receive and the motion. We have the motion to receive. That's passed. Okay. So I'm wondering if there's a follow up motion. The follow up motion would be for, considera uh, for consideration of sale to Ms. Jones. A direct sale of the direct whole lot? Sale. Yeah. Uh, that staff be directed to proceed with a direct sale to Ms. Jones? Yes. For the abutting parcel? Yes. Okay. Seconder? Councillor Yo? Do you want to speak to it, Councillor Elmsley? Councillor Yo? Question? Sorry, Councillor Dunn, question? <laughs> Try that button. There we go. Yeah. Um, I'm just afraid we're setting precedence again. Uh, we have a we have a policy. I have absolutely no issue whatsoever with the 1.4 meters. Uh, it solves the immediate problem, and uh, I think uh, we've established a policy that we we put our property. I, I don't even know how big this lot is. I don't know whether it's a full building lot. I, like I know nothing about the lot. Uh, I don't know whether it's in a good position, a bad position. Um, so uh, I have no issue at all with uh, with conveying the 1.4 meters and, and solving the problem. Um, I think that's a good idea. Uh, selling the lot uh, by, uh, by private sale um, and not having the public involved doesn't work for me and I've got to speak against the motion the way it's worded. Thank you. Councillor Riley. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, what's said is I think there has been a couple of precedents set. I think we're going to get market value for the lot. You brought, you said you brought the check for, uh, for the survey. I mean, did you bring a check for the lot too today, General, or anything? Oh, yeah. uh, I could manage oh, okay. that. Okay, well, maybe, maybe bring that Absolutely. next Absolutely. <laughs> okay, um, anyway, so I think with, uh, if we get, an, uh, we get an appraisal on it, as I think as, uh, our solicitor said before, that's the process. So I think that'll, that'll establish the price so there's, there won't, shouldn't be any complaints. Thank you, Councillor Richardson. I just want to follow up saying that I know Darlene's here today looking for resolutions, so whatever way we can make it work for her and her benefit, I would like to, to go that way. Well, one of the ways we can make that work is a direct sale of the yeah. entire lot. She's willing to do that at market value, so that's the motion Councillor Homsley's put forward. So are there any further comments on the motion? Uh, I'll support the motion as well. I think it, it gets us where we need to be. Um, call the question. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you for your deputation. I appreciate it. That'll be a recommendation to go to September 24th at council and we'll see what happens. Thanks. Uh, item 4.2 is a deputation regarding dock spaces in Thurstonia from Andrew Girdler. Uh, welcome, sir. You were on a schedule to do a deputation previously, but never showed up. Yes, I want to apologize for that. Uh, I was at Ross Memorial with my daughter. Uh, she ended up with shingles at the age of nine, so uh, uh, didn't know that happened. So uh, I apologize to council for not, not attending last time. Um, Go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and esteemed council members. Um, uh, I hope you all have the uh, handout of an article written by Mary Riley uh, from Kawartha Lakes this week, dated April 11th, uh, 2019. It is our hope that you will read uh, this at your leisure to refresh your memories of, uh, regarding our situation. Um, my name is Andrew Girdler. I've come before you today to plead my case uh, with the hope of persuading you to make an exception to the recent changes to the rules regarding dock allocation in the township of Greenhurst, Thurstonia. Um, initially, I was going to read an itemized list of the reasons why we should have a dock near our home, but I changed my mind on that. Uh, for the last 10 years, my wife, myself, my wife Barb, and my daughter Erica have been fighting to improve our credit and save money uh, <clears throat> with the goal of someday owning our own home. It was our friend Greg Arkwright uh, who, as the principal of Dunsford Public School, lured us to Dunsford, or the, the Dunsford area with the promise of helping Erica with a uh, small learning disorder she has. Uh, we moved to Dunsford in 2017, and I was told by the city of Kawartha Lakes that there were five dock spaces available, but I had to be a, a homeowner to, in the village before I could apply for one. Around the same time, uh, we ran into Ron Ashmore, who knocked on our door to introduce himself as a candidate for city, or, sorry, town council. Uh, his genuine interest in our situation was very evident, and he uh, continues to champion our cause to this very day. Um, with the passing of my father, Eric, and uh, just recently my mother, Janet, we were able to uh, use our inheritance to uh, for a down payment on a home. On August 28th, 2018, we uh, bought a 1930s era cottage on First Street in Dunsford, uh, which is a mere four doors up from beautiful, Lake Sturgeon, uh, beautiful Sturgeon Lake. Um, although homes in, uh, on the lakefront were not in our budget, we, our new home does have a beautiful view of the lake. We also hope to, to be able to relax on, <coughs> excuse me, on our own dock and be able to watch our children and our grandchildren uh, enjoy the lake. As a new homeowner, I phoned the city of Corth Lakes to ask about the availability of dock spaces and was told that all the dock spaces had been absorbed by the city to be turned into public access and that I could not apply for a lease at all. Um, we s could simply not believe what we were hearing. In less than a year, uh, city bylaws had completely reversed and, <clears throat> excuse me again, we struggled to make sense of their logic, but more importantly, we couldn't believe our bad luck. Uh, it is our hope that our presence here today will show you that we are uh, good, honest people, and that we have finally reached uh, our goal of owning our own home. And now we look to you to help us uh, complete our dream uh, by making an exception to these new bylaws and voting to allow us to lease a dock space near our new home on First Street in the village of Greenhurst, Thurstonia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Girdler. We'll see if there's any questions. We'll get a motion to receive, please. Councillor Seymour Fagan and Councillor Dunn, are there any questions for the deputant? Council Riley. Thank, thank you very much. Are you looking to get on the list or are you looking to actually get a dock? Uh, I tried to get on a list uh, uh, right after we bought our home and uh, they said they were not taking any more applicants and just not, uh, we, I've tried to be on the list since we, we, we actually rented it a year before we owned a home there and I was trying to get on a list then and they, I just kept, it was kept being told not that I could not be on a list. You had to be a homeowner. Yes. That's correct. Okay, maybe to, to Craig or to a solicitor, um, 
Would you care to elaborate on what are, uh, what are perhaps what's, some options? What's the process for somebody yeah. to apply for a doc space? Yeah, yeah. What's our current process? So uh, Realty Services received a, a lot of requests from individuals that currently don't have docs looking to get on a list or to be considered for a doc space. And what we decided that uh, we wouldn't maintain a list, that we would, um, that we would absorb. Uh, we recently removed six uh, abandoned docs from the, from the shoreline. Uh, but most of the 220 people in the area had renewed uh, and there was significant overcrowding. So we decided to not open up any spaces uh, for a, a new space and instead come to council uh, with a plan uh, in 2020 or later for the entire area, showing where there are um, perhaps docks not close to people's homes, perhaps there are residents that don't have docks so that might have an interest in a dock and try to find something that's perhaps a better use of space uh, overall. And so what we've been saying to everyone who approaches us is there's no list, we'll be bringing something forward uh, to council um, in 2020. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Ashmore, you had a question? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the deputy, thanks for coming today, Andrew, and, and your family. Um, just through you to, um, to uh, city solicitor. Um, so right now there's approximately 20 to 25 vacant lots left uh, and that's along the waterfront there's that haven't been spoken for or they've been either abandoned or or not uh, renewed their lease is that what would be the number right now please Sorry. Uh, yes so there are approximately 15 spots that are vacant spots, but could be a dock could be placed on those, and those are being uh, rented by people already. So maybe the case where a person has a dock, um, and then adjacent to it they want a little bit of space, they rent those spaces as well. Uh, there were six docks that were removed. However, I haven't been able to confirm, I haven't looked at the survey to confirm whether or not that actually frees up a sufficient amount of space or rather improves the remaining space. When we look at uh, the survey um, and look at dock problems, what we almost invariably run into is someone moved their dock half a foot and now everybody is impacted to the east or to the west and um, or somebody's moved the way they've placed their dock or uh, on one side of their dock versus the other and so the tightness of the space is indicating to me that it is premature at this point to one-off allow applicants to come in and, and take more space, but rather to look at the portfolio as a whole uh, in 2020 when we have an opportunity to review it and think of the, uh, the best distribution of the, of the docs when we're looking at it from a wholesome perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I see there's two main issues here. So we've got um, people that want to get on a list, a queue, if you help, if you will, a list, like basically first come, first serve, you're on a list and you're waiting in line to acquire a dock. So people like Andrew here and his wife, and they want to acquire a dock, but they'd like to get in, you know, on a list, at least on a list. So, and the other issue is there are people that just want to have it logistically closer to their, their property. They want to have their dock. They don't want it on the other end of the shoreline. They just want to have it as close as possible. Just for one final question uh, to Slister. Is there any way we could even just start, a, have a list of just of the people who are expressing interest, like just be on a list, uh, you know, to in the future. I don't know when the future is going to be, like how quickly we can, they can acquire a dock, but that's all they're asking for is, is a list. And the ones that are requesting, there's. I've got at least a half a dozen that are requesting uh, docks that are closer to them. Is that a possibility before the end of the year? So, uh, Council has considered, at least on one former uh, occasion, the uh, whether or not Realty Services should maintain a list. And after starting to maintain a list and realizing that having a list resulted in a lot of administration where people would call to see if they're on the list, then they would call to see what number they were on the list, then they would call to see how many people were on the list, and we'd get a lot of calls. So we realized that having a first come, first serve hadn't 
um, assisted this area very well because if you uh, have an open dock space but it's very far away from where your cottage is, because you're first on the list, you would go over there. But now you're driving over there and your neighbors are complaining about you parking on a very narrow Hazel Street, which is the waterfront street. So what we decided is we could approximate that everyone with a home w would want to have the benefit of a dock, even if they're not going to have a dock, to have dock space, to have the ability to sell, the ability to have dock space in proximity. So we thought we have already a map of the area, we know where the homes are, we know where the, we have a survey of the docks, we know where the dock spaces are. It would be best to look at the entire area and say what spaces do we have and what houses should be in what spaces to reduce that pressure on the waterfront in the future. And that was the plan we were planning to bring forward in 2020 to Council. Thank you. One final comment, please, and question. So um, what I think the people are more concerned about is if there's like 20 docks left, there could be a possibility of like 20 mini parks along. So 20 spaces plus the two or three public docks that there are. So there'd be the possibility of like 20, I call them mini parkettes or mini docks which are public spaces. So you'd have a lot of parking and public coming there, just so many different public spaces. Would, it, would that not evolve into that? If, if all those 20 spaces are gonna be public docks and you're gonna have, they're all gonna be public access points, right? 20 different ones? So this is a very um, narrow shoreline in most places. It steeply drops off. So in most cases, um, removing a, a dock or a dock space uh, without there being stairs down, uh, you won't have a significant impact on people accessing the water. But where it is flattened or where there's more space, you would have people sunning uh, themselves or swimming from there. People aren't uh, able to, to use it as a backyard, but they would be able to use it as uh, any other city-owned uh, shoreline road allowance. So that wouldn't be a concern. That would be the intent of the shoreline is to open it up to allow people to go across and put out a blanket and go for a swim for the day. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion to receive. Are there any further questions? Call the question, all in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Appreciate hearing your concerns. Um, just, just so you know, at this time, a motion to receive by council means no further action is taken. So council's choosing at this point to let the solicitor roll out her plan for next year. So I would say keep in touch with Councillor Ashmore and I'm sure he'll, uh, he'll let you know when it's time to, uh, to bring that forward again. Thanks for coming today, appreciate it. Uh, we'll move down to item 4.3, which is an encroachment license agreement, the use of city-owned land adjacent, adjacent to Stanley Road in Woodville. Uh, Kevin Waldock, welcome, sir. All right, just put the mic. You Sorry. got it. There we go. Sorry, I just got to get some up here. Um, hey, thanks for having me today, Honorable Mayor and Council. Um, thanks for hearing, hearing us out on this uh, deputation. So I, I guess um, before I start, I just got to say that it's, it's a strange situation because of the previous ownership of her house is the complainant as well as her sisters on the other side. So just kind of keep that in mind as I kind of speak here. So I'm here today to make an adaptation in order to be able to encroach on city lands with our garden shed and our kids playset. Um, um, we've lived in our house for four years, and our shed and our background, back, our, our shed and our playground have always been been there. Um, at the time of purchase, I mean, I didn't even know what a concession allowance was, let alone be able to kind of see what that meant for our backyard and stuff like that. Um, and we were definitely misled a little bit by uh, by by realtors and different things about where where the backyard line is. And when we put up our, our simple garden shed, like it's, it's eight by 10, um, we put it in line with the garden shed that was, um, that was at 127. Um, so I guess, so then I guess they, um, the previous owners built beside us. Um, and, and so for, I guess for the last two years, um, it's just been a constant bombardment of bylaw officers coming probably a dozen times complaining about the shed and, and different things in our backyard. And I handed to bylaw, the bylaw officers of Corth Lakes are nothing but excellent. Uh, we've had great dealings with them. And in late 2018, they led us to the bylaw that, that um, 
that you can get a license agreement to encroach on the city lands and that would take care of our problem. Um, so we applied for the encroachment and, uh, and uh, we were approved in late 2019, early 2019. Um, and then in April 2019, we were emailed saying that the uh, encroachment was revoked. Um, so I guess if you guys could just look quickly, oh, I guess that's a, gr that's a good, good uh, map that's up there right now, but I guess figure one that I've pictured, that was sent to me from the city in the, in the agreement. Um, you can see the concession allowance runs, runs directly across all the backyards at Stanley Road. Um, um, if you look at our figure one in your yellow folder, uh, where we're encroaching is on city concession allowance within the red square there. And, um, and uh, so when we follow the concession al allowance along Stanley Road there, with all the other, all my other neighbors, there's sheds, there's, um, sorry, there's, there's fences, there's decks, there's sheds, there's bunkies all built on this concession allowance. And uh, generally, it's completely cutting off access to that concession allowance. Um, um, our encroachments on the city property are very minor compared to a lot of our neighbors. And I, I feel like it's just kind of, it's, it's silly not to be able to encroach it. There's also numerous docks as well. Um, if you look at uh, one of the pictures I've attached on the last page in your yellow folder, looking directly along the concession allowance, you can see as you look along, there's a, there's a shed to the left. That's on the concession allowance. There's in the, in the background, there's a fence. So that is the, what we're talking about here. That's the concession allowance that people want to access. And that's um, the other pictures attached are kind of over, over shots of our backyard. You can see there's no, there's no fences. There's nothing to perm to to stop anybody from walking through and back there. Uh, nor have we ever stopped anyone from access to the park lot or the concession allowance in our four years there. And that's just not something we've ever ran into and we've never done, or would we? Um, you know, we're good stewards of the land back there. We remove leaves in the fall. We've never cut down any trees. Um, when, you know, looking through the backyard, there's evidence that this backyard has been cleared in the past by the previous owners because um, there's no shrubbery, there's no bush back there, just like if you compare it to where the park lot is there. Um, uh, I guess another thing I should note is, you know, we've been, we, we were having trouble getting Kawartha Lakes named on our insurance, um, but we've been told that we're, we're the shed and the place that is, 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 um, is under my home insurance under outbuildings, the outbuilding clause. And, um, and I'm, I'm still currently working with, well, at the time before our encroachment got revoked, we were working with the city to try and figure out how to get the city named on, our, on, the, on the agreement. If I could just speak quickly about our dock, I didn't really notice that before I saw the submissions to council from the next, um, sorry, from the next deputation that, that the dock and all that stuff was included. So, so um, so our dock, so I guess we've pulled the deeds from the, we've pulled the deeds from public record of the parkland lot that kind of is kind of near where our dock is. And uh, we found that there's no listed specific water access. Um, the city, the city through Realty Services, uh, through our encroachment, um, told us that our dock isn't actually on city owned lands. Um, and so I don't know why it's an issue to be talked about here. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and for us, it's a liability issue for our dock. Like we can't have unknown. And so that's why there's a no trespassing sign up. We put that up um, on the advice of a lawyer to say that if someone we don't know walks on our dock, slips and injures themselves, then at least we have one foot on the ground to be able to defend ourselves from liability suits and different things like that. I'll just ask you to wrap it up if you can. Yeah, please. sorry. Last question. It's just like, it's like we're, we're a young family. We got three boys. And you know, having having a playset out back of the house is not a, a crazy, you know, asking for the city and and a place to put their bikes and stuff like that. But thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll see if there's any questions for you. If you want to sit tight, um, get a motion to receive, please. Councillor Yo and Seymour Fagan. Are there any questions for the deputant? We have another deputant right afterwards uh, who's one of the neighbors, so we should hear. Go ahead, Councillor Yo. Uh, question, actually a question for staff through you, if I could, uh, Ms. Carlson. Why, um, and I, I was briefly over to have a look to see what this situation was all about. So why would we 
revoke, uh, we we're going into an agreement with these people on encroachment agreement on a road allowance. Why would we step back and say, oh, we don't want to do that anymore? Land Management Committee, when we had first looked at the uh, request for an encroachment agreement, approved it, uh, thinking that it would have minimal impairment on the abilities of the neighbors to walk through the road allowance to the water. Uh, and the um, request was for the backyard encroachments only, not the dock on the what's called the parkland, which is a, a vacant uh, municipally owned property to the left of number 147 on the map. Uh, however, then as we were going through the process of licensing uh, the property, we got a complaint from one of the neighbors saying it did impact uh, her sight lines to the water uh, and uh, her ability to walk through the concession road. Uh, and she's provided, I believe she's the second deputant here today. And so um, on the basis that we wouldn't want to license encroachments, uh, at least at the staff level, that caused a, a neighborhood uh, problem, we revoked that, uh, as well as the encroachments into the side yard at 147 into the city-owned block, which I believe that the second deputant will be speaking about today. So, and, um, so follow up. So the, um, the lot beside 147 is actually parkland. It's not a road allowance, it's, it's parkland, probably in lieu of cash when it was developed. So that one I could understand the lack of an encroachment agreement. The other one being a road allowance, and given the nature of the entire shoreline, um, basically encroaching on the, uh, the road allowance, I, uh, and a swing set and a, an eight by 10 shed, I don't see the uh, severity in the encroachment. So I guess it brings up a question, like when you get an encroachment agreement on a piece of property, does it prohibit other people from going on that property? Or is it simply allowing you the use of it of having a swing set on public land. So it's not ex it's not exclusive use, it's not a lease. It just allows you to have your property there and people can walk around. I believe the complaint from the neighbor is when there's a swing set and a, a dock, or sorry, a, a shed there, you it has the indicia of private and then doesn't welcome people to walk through. So I believe that that was the complaint from the neighbor. Thank you. Councillor Seymour Fagan, did you have a question? That was it? So your property is 129, is that correct? And right behind yep, you correct. is the road allowance, and then right behind that is the park yeah, designated it's like, um, lot, right? Yeah, so you see on the map, so we back onto the concession allowance and slightly on the parkland there. Although where the parkland ends is actually kind of a disputable thing because of uh, uh, the township of Eldon never bought it in 1964 from the, from the MNR when they went around on the one-time sell of people getting that 66 feet from the water. Yeah. But your lot is 129. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sir. Yes. One, we're 129. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Don't argue with me. <laughs> <laughs> 129. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for the deputy, Councilor Riley? Uh, not totally in defense of realtors, but uh, when you bought the lot, uh, what kind of advice did you get from your lawyer? Um, just that, that it's, we didn't really get too much advice on it from the lawyer. I, I remember when we bought it, it was quick sign, sign, here's the keys kind of thing. So there was nothing really written in there. Well, I just thought and perhaps he might have noticed something on the, on the property or on the deed that might have made this easier for her, that was all. Yeah, yeah. I, we didn't really, like I said, I didn't know what a concession allowance was. And, you know, we were pretty, we were pretty uh, ignorant kind of coming in. So, you know what I mean? We didn't really know, kind of, we had to be worried about that stuff. Thank you. Councillor Elmsley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, so your encroachment is how much on the city property with your shed? Um, like uh, how far my shed's out there. It's literally a foot or two from the property line. So you're really not impeding anybody from going back and forth on that? Location. No, there's no physical impediment at all. And, and the uh, play equipment is? Um, it's probably about 15 to 20 feet back. It's kind of back a bit further because of, because of all the trees back there and just so they it, can. Is it encroaching or not? 
Um, oh, it's encroaching like in the red box for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure it's encroaching. And does it impede people from? Not up? physically, no. And, and of course you have the additional space for the unoccupied land beside 147. Um, is your shed movable? Um, I guess, yes and no. <laughs> I hope if we move it, it's not going to break. But, I mean, if we have to move it, and that's council's decision, that's what we'll do. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I guess somewhat movable. Six out of ten. Is, seven is out of it, ten. It's on patio stones or... Uh, I mean, it's, actually, it's just on the ground, but it's just a plastic thing. So I think four big guys could probably lift it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I guess I guess our main thing is that like everyone else that's encroaching on this land, it's like because we went through the legitimate channels to get licensed, we're being we're being um, we're being kind of un not unfairly treated, but kind of unfairly treated. And I just can't think of a better word for that right now. Is there room in your backyard for the swing set in the shed? P pardon me, sir. Is there room in your backyard for the swing set in the shed? I, I know don't. they're out encroaching, but do they have to be? I mean, is there room in your backyard? No, if that great question, yeah. If there was room, then they'd already be there. But I guess the the previous when they built on one twenty nine, it was fairly tight to the to the actual property line. But is there room now if the shed and the swing set have to be moved onto your property? Is there room to put them there, or would they have to just be removed completely? I think they well, I guess if, if I have to stay completely off of the concession allowance, then there might not be room. Okay. Thank you. We have a motion to receive. Any more questions? Call the question. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you for coming today. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll move right, right into our next deputation, which is item 4.4, uh, use of city-owned property adjacent to Stanley Road in Woodville. Robin Wagnell and Debbie Stillmunks. I'm not sure I, Debbie, you don't need to speak. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Just get you to push that. You got it. Yep. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council and guests, my name is Robin Wagnall. I'm a resident of Stanley Road, Balsover. I'm here today for the, court, the City of Kortha Lakes to help me reinstate my freedom to the access and public land owned by the court, City of Kortha Lakes. This includes safe access to Butternut Creek. Also, I'm requesting the city to protect and maintain the natural forest of the road allowance and parkland bordering my property. My current concerns are about the deforestation and alterations of the city property. First, this area could be user-friendly. One should feel safe to walk without the fear of unleashed dogs roaming on public lands. Also, objects in the city property make it difficult to navigate walking, especially for those items that impede or cause safety issues. For example, trailers, wood piles, sheds, no trespassing signs, intimidating, intimidating those wanting to access their own boat and dock. Everyone should also be free to enjoy the water's edge and boating. Clarifying public use should further prevent bullying and intimidations. In 2016, I called the city of Court the Lakes. I had concerns about a large drum, plastic containers, pails, a trailer, and questionable supplies dumped on the road allowance in front of my property. The city inspector came to look and assess the property. He was quick to notice that there were more problems with items on the road allowance and parkland. Therefore, more city personnel investigated these properties. This led to unexpected reprisal from my neighbors that was unjustified. This also led to my attendance at this meeting today. In the past, damages occurred on the parkland, road allowance, and my property. The first time a truck was driven on my property as well as a road allowance to the water edge. This caused damage by barging through bush and trampling the land, creating a distinct road. I did not consent to the use of my property for any of these actions. The underbrush and small trees were mowed down. To my distress, a few years later, it happened again. A heavy truck with drilling equipment plowed its way through the road allowance onto my property, cutting down a tree. This was done without my consent. I did not receive any apology for the damage or the loss of the tree. I remained quiet and did not confront the people responsible either time. Why is this damage important to me? For one thing, the forest has not recovered from compressed earth causing irreparable damage to the root base of the trees. Root damage happens while the trucks barge through the underbrush passing the trees. Many of these trees along the road allowance path look tired and have a dramatic loss of branches and trees. Secondly, 
City and private properties are being heavily used without permission. These properties should be protected. This includes ATVs and snowmobiles. Natural restoration could have been made possible without the land repeatedly beaten down. About the water access. 50 years ago, the previous owner of my property built a dock. However, there is no trespassing sign preventing me or anyone else from going on this dock from the road lounge attached to the same property. Since my phone call in 2016, the city has begun to educate all the residents about the park and road lounge. I learned that some bylaws changed during my lengthy time in the community. To reiterate, my hope is that the city staff continues to educate all residents to public use and protection of the park area and protect the environment of the road allowance. The owners of the properties boarding the road allowance in question are mostly second and third generations. Back in the 50s, my father put a garage on the road allowance. Why is this important? In the 70s, my father was informed by the city to move the structure off the city-owned property. He tried to buy the property, but could not, so he moved the cottage. It seems like history may be repeating itself. The road allowance became a pathway for neighbours and children to freely pass back and forth socialising with each other. Currently, there is a sign claiming ownership of the water access, alleging Kawartha Lake's approval. Another stating no trespassing. I am here to ask, why are we no longer free to walk on this path? I have provided attachments to my original submission. Please refer to these for further clarification. I am grateful for your time and look forward to having transparency in any future communication. Thank you. We'll see if there's any questions for you. Um, motion to receive, please. Councillor Vale and Richardson. Are there any questions for the deputant? So your lot is 131, is that correct? So 131 and the two beside it. Okay. Are there any questions for the deputant? Councillor Yo? Um, thank you. And through you to the deputant. Um, how long did you, you're the former owner of 129, am I correct? Uh, until about 2004. Can I just get you to put your microphone on again? Yeah. Uh, until 2004. Okay. And um, at that time, what was on the road allowance when you owned the property? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. And, um, Second question, the, um, we're not dealing with the parkland as far as the previous deputation, but your deputation mentions the parkland beside 147. I was told to include both. Yeah, okay, so my question, I will ask a question on that. The uh, encroachment on 147, to the best of my knowledge, is about two feet of a shed, is that correct? In 147, uh, I think I included uh, an aerial of 2013, uh, which looks quite a bit different than the aerial of 2008. Right, okay. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions? So, to the city solicitor, are we, where is this in the process right now? I know we applied for the encroachment, we were gonna process it, we put it on hold when Ms. Wagnall, sorry, Ms. Wagnall complained. Um, and so where are we in the process now, obviously, they were coming today, so maybe you can just update us on where we are if we just received this deputation. There were uh, active um, requests for enforcement of the encroachment bylaw respecting 147 and 129, so both of the properties. Uh, those were placed on hold until uh, the owners could make a deputation, uh, and then pending council disposition, then bylaw would continue to follow up with uh, removal uh, of the uh, encroaching structures. Yeah, thank you. So we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Good. Follow up. Um, I guess as a follow up, now we would need to send this to council with some sort of recommendation on on the one the encroachments on both pieces of property. What, 147 and 129, is that what we, we'd have to do right now? I think if we just receive these, then the enforcement of the encroachments on these vacant, on these road allowances will be enforced by bylaw, but it's been put on hold 
pending these deputations here today. Is that correct? Yes, and I should clarify that with 147, there were numerous encroachments into the side yard. However, there appeared to be one a partial encroach, encroachment of a shed, a permanent shed or garage, that we thought was uh, it would make sense for it to remain. Um, so pending a confirmation that the um, shed is in fact over the east lot line as shown in the sketch provided to us and not over the west, which would be a problem, then we would be able to license that. We thought that the um, that that minorly impaired the use of the park uh, block and could have significant impacts on 147 if we had asked the owners to remove it. But that's coming off lot 147, correct? That's correct. Okay, well, I'm going to make a follow-up now then that uh, the encroachment for the uh, children's swing set and, and paraphernalia on 129 uh, be permitted to receive an encroachment agreement. Proceed with an encroachment agreement yes. for 129 as the original application? Yes, and if, um, if the shed is determined to be a visual distraction for the neighbor, then the shed, I've seen it, it is a plastic shed, it can be moved. Um, so if that is a problem, um, then I'm sure they can move the shed, but the, uh, the swing set and the, and the kids play Play set is very, very minimal on the property, and I don't see a problem with having an encroachment agreement for that. Okay, you get a seconder. Councillor Seymour Fagan, you'll second that. Do you want to speak to it? Any questions, comments, clarity on the follow up? Councillor Dunn? Through you to the uh, Director of um, uh, Community Services. Um, is that park an active park? Like, do we do any kind of maintenance on it, or is it just parkland that's available to us if we want to have it for parkland? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the council, no, that is not an active park, and we uh, provide no maintenance to that property at this present time. Ms. Magno, we're good. We're finished with the deputation. We're just dealing with a follow-up. Thank you for coming today. Uh, Thank we're you. We're just going to have a little discussion here about this follow-up motion. Councillor Elmsley, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to whoever on staff, are there other encroachments on this road allowance besides uh, 129? It appears from the aerial that there are numerous. However, uh, by law only received complaints about uh, encroachments in the side yard from 147 and in the backyard at 129. So if we were going to enforce and then the, the and make people remove stuff from the encroachment, wouldn't it be fair to make everybody remove their stuff from encroachment rather than just one, one uh, individual? Uh, my understanding is that bylaw uh, enforces the bylaw just based on a complaint basis, but that we had been looking at uh, more proactively um, enforcing the encroachment bylaw starting in 2020, which would give um, the public some time to uh, be prepared for the encroachment bylaw. So are you saying that if we enforce this encroachment, if we enforce the removal of the shed and the swing set from the road allowance that in 2020 we would go back and ask the other neighbors to remove theirs? as well if we had removed uh this this sheds and swing sets from 129 and 147 that would end the removals but in 2020 realty services would look at whether it made sense to similarly provide licenses to the neighbors or request that the neighbors remove their uh, docks as well councillor dunn you had a follow-up I'm going, to, um, I'm going to speak in favor of the motion. Um, this is land that we're not currently using. I like encroachment agreements because we've established that it's our land. We've, we've actually got a formal process in place to establish who actually owns the land. And while we're not using it, I have, uh, I have no issue with, the, uh, with somebody else using it. So I'll, I'll speak in favor of the motion. That's interesting. Uh, for those exact reasons, I'll speak against it. Um, I, I, 
I think that, you know, it's a road allowance that is, is used by the community and if the neighbors can work it out, then I'm all for that if somebody wants to utilize it. But when there's a disagreement, then I think it has to be one size fits all. And, and, and if that people feel that that should be used for the, for the community to access that road allowance, then, then I think it should be, should be kept clear until they can come to some kind of an agreement as a community to use it. So I won't be, I won't be supporting uh, the motion. Are there any further comments? I'll ask Councillor Yo to sum up. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, and uh, through you, I, uh, I know the point you're making. Um, this, uh, to me, is a little bit different than just a road allowance because there is a separate parcel beside it that is parkland. It's two distinct parcels of land. They're both public, they're both accessible, and we're talking about a swing set on a great big piece of public property. And uh, for that reason, the encroachment agreements in this case make sense. And if we open that can of worms, there's gonna be a lot of unhappy people in this neighborhood and I don't want to be the counselor when that happens. <laughs> Thank you. That's a pretty honest sum up, isn't it? Um, are we clear on the motion, Madam Clerk? Do you want to just read it so that we're all on board? That the encroachment agreement for 129 Stanley Road, Woodville proceed as requested except for the uh, garden shed. But if they've got an encroachment agreement, they can leave the shed there. So how do you want so me to do that? Is there any suggestions on wording? If so the motion for the encroachment agreement for the swing set, but not the shed. Play stuff, but not including the shed. Okay. And you're okay you seconded that? Does you agree with that? Everybody clear? We'll call the question. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Uh, those recommendations will go to Council on September 24th. Uh, thank you folks for coming. Uh, we're going to move right into our presentations, which is item 5.1, uh, which is a presentation from our Fire Chief, Mark Pankhurst. Uh, regarding the uh, 2019 flood update. Welcome, sir. Just give us a second to pull it up here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. i just take, like take a few minutes to uh, provide an overview of um, the flooding event that we experienced in uh, the city this past spring. So like a couple things, just an overview of our activities, uh, talk about the disaster recovery for our residents, the, the municipal recovery program, uh, the communications that took place throughout, our debrief meetings, and our future mitigation plans and going forward. Okay, so some of this is going to piggyback on uh, the presentation that Fourth Conservation did. But just uh, a couple points or, or major highlights here. It was higher, longer, and more than uh, previous years. And the 2019 flooding was uh, contained more water than any other flood um, in this mun municipality's history that were since we've been inhabiting this area, anyways. So the water levels for 2019 were 20 centimeters higher than the historic flood of 2013. The 2019 flood was three weeks longer than average. There were 5,000 liters more water per second flowing than in 2013, and 80,000 liters of water more per second than in 2018. And unfortunately, in the, in the fine print at the bottom, it says that the floodplain mapping project completed by Kawartha Conservation has shown that, has shown the potential discharge and flow rate for the Burnt River could be double of this year's historic event in future flooding events. So, you know, it's just something that it's not gonna go away with uh, the climate change that we've uh, experienced. Um, these, uh, these events are becoming more frequent than less. And it's just something that we need to uh, be cognizant of and ensure that we have uh, good mitigation and communications plans moving forward. So, you know, the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, that was at the height of the flooding in the Burnt River area. And you can see the, the cottage on the right. Um, it was built up uh, probably 
after a flood a few years ago where the place on the left wasn't. A few people have, um, um, you know, taken steps to mitigate uh, their losses and damage over the years. But to our surprise, there was a neighbor in that, uh, in that neighborhood who just moved in about three years ago. I'm going to speak to that a little bit later on. And uh, came out from the city. It was actually, I can't say what they, they did. It'll probably give away who it was. But they were totally unaware of any uh, previous flooding in the neighborhood. So one of our mitigation plans is uh, to post some signs, and I'll get to that in a minute as well. So basically, uh, as flooding season approaches, uh, Environment Canada weather predictions, we, they're closely monitored by us. And uh, unfortunately, we've come to, uh, to know that we can't really count on the weatherman because things change so, so quickly. And I'll get to that, but uh, flood, you know, basically we monitor three distinct flooding areas. So we have the burnt that we're well familiar with, very familiar with. We have the Gull River and the Black River system. So when you drive up Highway 35, when you get to the Minden area, just kind of east of Minden, that's where the, uh, the Burnt River watershed comes through from the Five Lakes system, uh, Canning, Cashawigamog, those lakes, and the Irondale uh, River system as well merged just east of there. But just north, when you get up north of Carnarvon, heading up into the Dorset area, you have the Black and the Gull River system. The headwaters are uh, Sherburne Lake, St. Nora Lake, where the Frost Center is and behind there. So that's the start of the, uh, the uh, Gull River system. And then just uh, the next lake north, Raven and Wren Lake, on your way into Dorset, that's the, uh, the Black River system. So this year, we were really, at the beginning, at the onset, we were focusing on the Black River system because there was still quite a bit of snowpack up in the bush. There was still almost a meter uh, of snow and ice in the bush, and they were predicting uh, 15 to 25 millimeters of rain. So our sandbagging and our concentration was on the Black River area. And then, unfortunately, uh, we received 90 to 95 millimeters of rain on uh, April 19th, and then the next day we received an additional 15 millimeters of rain. So that was, uh, they were predicting um, the 15, um, or sorry, they were predicting 25 to, uh, to 40 millimeters of rain, which shouldn't really have caused too much of a problem, um, but it, it was more than double, almost triple the amount of rainfall. So that was a bit of a game changer. So by Saturday, April the 20th, the water levels at uh, the Burnt River had uh, reached their flooding thresholds. Um, the Red Cross had notified us that they had been called to assist uh, five families, and they had been deployed to the area, so we set up and gave them a hand with that. And several roads uh, were closed by Saturday evening in the Burnt River area. So on the 21st, Public Works began sandbagging operations at the Bur Burnt River uh, Works Yard. And uh, eight people from the Cedar Plank Road, they required assistance to be evacuated from their homes as water levels continued to rise and road access was cut off. So we were called um, to respond to Crooked Court and Basswood Road to assist residents. Um, approximately 1,600 sandbags were filled at the Burnt River Depot through the day and an inventory of 1,000 sandbags was maintained throughout the flood. And uh, the water levels appeared to crest by uh, 8 o'clock uh, that evening on April 21st. But of course, that doesn't mean that it's over. We, it takes a while for things to start to recede and we're still kind of in that rescue and emergency response mode and uh, working, moving more in towards uh, the recovery functions. So by April 22nd, the Burnt River was uh, showing signs of decline. We continued sandbagging operations at the Burnt River Depot. Uh, Black River, Moore Lake, and Gull Lake were increasing in levels and Moore Lake was uh, above average level. Again, that's coming from uh, the snowpack up in uh, Halliburton Highlands, uh, the Muskoka area. So by April 23rd, sandbagging operations were continuing. The snowpack had mostly melted uh, in the watershed, the northern watershed. And as of April 23rd, the Red Cross had provided assistance to a total of 25 individuals. Burnt River levels continued to decline and level off. And uh, a briefing on the, on the flood impact was submitted to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing on April 25th. And on May 3rd, 2019, the Ministry rep toured the flooded area. So our Disaster Recovery Assistance uh, Program for Ontarians. So there was, there's been some changes. So uh, I think we communicated this a couple times to Council over the course. So provincial changes to disaster assistance do not require the declaration of an emergency by the municipality which we didn't, 
and coverage for homeowners, primary, uh, it's for primary residents only, small owner operated businesses and farms, and insurance policies are the first pair. So those are the two or three of the main points from that program. And eligible expenses include cleanup, cost to repair, replace essential property, basic emergency expenses such as uh, evacuation and travel costs as well. Oh, I went too far, sorry. Uh-oh. Okay, back on track here. So the municipal disaster recovery, the municipal disaster recovery assistance program. So that's for our municipalities. So we sat in, Craig sat in on it as well too, or Director Shanks on a conference call. So it's uh, provincial assistance to help municipalities that have incurred extraordinary costs because of a natural disaster. Uh, the city of Quartha Lakes did not meet the provincial thres threshold this year for municipal funding. So communications. Communications has always been uh, the key to uh, our success as a municipality with, with uh, helping us through and guiding us through uh, uh, with our residents, um, uh, what we're doing and uh, next steps and just to keep everybody informed uh, in uh, a real time or very timely um, uh, method of, uh, of most importantly keeping our residents informed of what's happening and what we're doing for them. So before, during and after the flood, Information was distributed in tax inserts. On, uh, it was also on the city website. It was on Twitter. It was on Facebook. It was on Ping Street. And it was also on roadside signs. I think on um, most major intersections or crossroads uh, in the flood areas, there was uh, the billboard signs. And uh, all of that uh, appeared to be very effective. And also, uh, we took uh, the mayor um, with us with communications and senior fire staff to tour the, the affected area. And uh, um, a film was, uh, or a, a video was filmed with the mayor at the Cedar Plank area. And there were over 15,000 views in two weeks of the mayor's flood video. And all the comments that we received back were all very positive on that. So kudos to our communication, communication staff. They did a great job as usual for us. So over that time, or just post uh, flood, we had uh, a number of debrief meetings. So we had a flood debrief meeting. Uh, one was held with uh, the mayor and ward councillors, and then we had a second one with uh, city staff. So several items were discussed and will be implemented as part of the future flood mitigation strategy. There we go. Oh. I keep hitting this thing and it doesn't seem to be working. Okay, here we go, so going forward. So the flood contingency plan is being updated with key dates and times incorporated for flood, pre for flood preparations. So our, our, our target goal moving forward will be that we'll have 300, or sorry, 3,000 sandbags will be prepared in advance of the 2020 flood season. And we've predetermined some locations and the locations that have been designated will be for both sandbags and or sandbag supplies will be the Burnt River Community Center, the Dalton Community Center, Chisholm Trail south of Black River, the Cobaconk Service Center, the Medical Center parking lot, Norland Municipal parking lot off of Monk Road, Cozy Cove and Highway 121, and the Cedar, uh, Cedar Plank and Riverbank roads. Also going forward, um, our first 2020 flood operations meeting will take place in February to assess the environmental conditions for the upcoming season and determine target dates for sandbag operations. So sandbags and supplies Sandbag and supply locations will be posted by the communications division when they are in place. And I talked uh, briefly about signs. So we're going to, um, we've already uh, assigned the task. Um, new signs will be erected to notify people that they are entering into a floodplain and directing them to the city website for information. So some of the key locations will be on 121 north of Fenlon. Um, and so uh, as an example, so we're hoping to have a, you know, uh, a good sized sign that says you are entering into a floodplain area and a, a direct link to the city website. So any, you know, prospective buyers uh, and, um, in the area so we can avoid what we, we, uh, we encountered this year with a new resident being unaware. Um, you know, we're probably going to get some pushback from, from uh, maybe uh, the real estate uh, community, but I think we need to be open and transparent to uh, any future residents and visitors that they are entering into a, a floodplain. 
Um, I, I think it's just the right thing to do. Uh, also, Human Services is developing a standard operating procedure to include uh, evacuation processes as well. Uh, we do have a really good, our Human Services uh, and Emergency Services have a really good working relationship with the Red Cross and uh, that always pays huge dividends uh, when we have these types of events. So in closing, a uh, big thank you. Thank you to uh, Fire Services staff who worked uh, tirelessly on uh, you know, emergency response, filling sandbags, and again to our communications team. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be as successful in what we do in delivering these services for sure without that support. Of course, the OPP, the Quartha Lakes Police Service, they have a, a, a less of a role, but again, it's uh, dispatching multiple calls as well as all the other uh, important stuff that they do over there. Red Cross, Brian's Group, Public Works, Human Services, Quartha Conservation Authority, Ministry of uh, Natural Resources, Trent Severn Waterway, and everyone else who spent many hours working during the flood event. It was a very collaborative team effort throughout the flood event, and thank you once again. Thanks, Chief. We'll see if there's any questions for you. Get a motion to receive, please. Councillor Elmsley and Yo. Councillor Elmsley, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, probably a couple. Uh, Chief, I'm not going to go over past history of, of this event, but going forward, um, is there any thought given, we used to drop sand and empty bags on some of the roads, one of them being the moorings, where, and the people would fill them themselves. And this speaks to the volunteer component because I did get many calls where people wanted to come and help and we basically turned them away. So I'm wondering if uh, we're considering something along those lines. Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council, that's, uh, we have two of those locations listed. Um, not the moorings, but I'm sure we can have a further discussion about that. But the two areas that we have identified are Cozy Cove and Highway 121 and the Cedar Plank and River Plank, River Plank areas. Are you dropping sandbags there? Or are you dropping sand, sand and bags in those locations? And they'll fill them yes. themselves? Yeah, it's just uh, in some of these locations, uh, the people are mm, my age and maybe humping around sandbags full are, are difficult for them. So having them empty and the ability to fill them themselves, I think uh, is a better plan. Um, I'm glad to see that we're going to have flood meetings starting in February because uh, uh, I don't think there's any percentage in saying, well, let's see if it's going to flood, let's see, because I pretty much guarantee you right now it will, you know, so uh, I'm happy to see that. Uh, the other thing I wondered about was fire services in the past has on the bad roads uh, gone door to door to make sure that people weren't in trouble. Uh, I don't think we did that this time and I'm wondering if you're thinking of reinstating it because I really feel it's an extra step and care and concern for uh, our residents, particularly some of our elderly residents. Uh, not at this time, or, um, th through the mayor to uh, council. Um, we've, we've analyzed that to death. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a game changer these days when our folks have to uh, get on their ATVs and uh, the whole standard of personal protective equipment and the limitations in that, equip in that equipment for them being able to function uh, has greatly increased for their own safety. Uh, we just can't do that anymore. Um, you know, we're, 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 that's where we're really counting on the local community and uh, the folks on those streets, you know, to, to help look after their neighbor, neighbor. And I can give you examples, like we were in those streets, um, I don't know if you, you may or may not recall when we had our debrief meetings, and we were there once and we said, we're here, if anybody needs any assistance, if you wanna go, come on out. We were back again, asked the same question, and then at 11 o'clock that night, you know, we get the call that someone needs evacuation. So we're already there doing those other activities. We're just not going door to door. We just don't have the resources. It's just too, too cumbersome with our equipment to do that. So we're really relying on the community. And again, you know, people know that it floods every year. There's the people that don't know that move into the community. And then there's people that, you know, have been there 
you know, 30, 40, 50 years, right? Um, their best off is just to pack up, make everything safe, and go somewhere else for those few days, you know? And I just want to say, like, for 50 weeks of the year, it's a Shangri-La up there. It's a beautiful community. But for two weeks of the year, it's a disaster. So, you know, we're really hoping that people will, especially as the community ages, and we're seeing that, some of the people that we're really helping out are older residents, that they, they go and stay with family somewhere else. Just look after their kids. But there's, make sure, batten down the hatches, and just the best thing to do is just go somewhere safe for a couple weeks if they can, or a couple days, anyways. Thank you. I'm sure we'll have more conversations as we go forward. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Ashmore. Mr. Mayor, um, through you to, to the Chief, thanks for your presentation. Just a question on um, some of the factors that caused it, and would you, would you say that the increased ice pack and the snow pack? were one of the major things because this event happens every year as we know but um, was that one of the things that you would say contributed to it the excessiveness of the flooding through uh, the marriage of council every year seems to be there's some similarities but there always seems to be some differences as well too um, in the burnt river area this year like just that northeast area of minden with irondale and the five lake chain the snow had, even though winter seemed to drag on for a long period of time, uh, a lot of that heavy snow and ice pack did recede. In that particular case, it was the over 100 millimeters of rain that they received. That was the game changer. Uh, up, up north in uh, kind of the, the Black River watershed, we only have a few residents that are, that are affected there. But as you saw in the Muskoka region, which went through you know, the other side of the Muskoka River area, that snowpack with the rain greatly uh, caused some huge problems up there. I have never, I have a cottage up there as well too, some of you may know. Um, so I, I have, I can see that I use that, uh, that whole area kind of as a visual guide for me. But I can tell you all of the lakes from basically Kawartha Lakes right up through to Muskoka were drained to levels that I've never seen them so low. Uh, but with that, with that amount of rain and, uh, and the snowpack in those areas, uh, there, you know, you can't stop Mother Nature. That, that's, that was a, so between the rain and the snowpack, especially in the northern areas, that was a bit of an anomaly this into, uh, that late into um, uh, April and May. The ice never went off the, those northern lakes until the first week of May this year, which is usually, which is unusual as well. So I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, there's, there's a lot of similarities, but uh, the rain usually is the game changer in this particular year. There's 100 millimeters of rain and then s heavy snow and ice packs still in some, in some of those northern areas. That's good. Thanks. And just one question. Like I know what, it went into Pigeon Lake a little bit this year. Not, certainly nothing compared to Burnt River. But one of the things kind of gnawing at me is did Trent Severn Waterway ever communicate to you as to their water levels? Because a lot of people have asked have they contributed to this flooding? And, and have you ever got a straight answer from Trent Sever Waterway as far as how much water was let into the system and whether that cause was a contributing factor to this flood? Through uh, the Mayor to Council, we communicate at the height of the flood uh, every day. We're on a conference call. Um, Court of Conservation, it takes the lead on that with uh, Trent Severn Waterway or Parks Canada, the Ministry of Natural Resources. And we get uh, real-time information. Uh, from my experience in dealing with the flooding in the last 10 years, I think the water management on the Trent system that we know down here, and then all of the lakes that feed in, the feeder lakes from up north, are probably being managed the best that they've been managed, in my experience anyways. Uh, one of the biggest problems with uh, Trent Severn in, in managing water, a lot of it was visual, kind of what I described a couple minutes ago with looking at just looking at the lakes they didn't have uh, newer technology for flow meters they would actually have to drive and do an estimate use some kind of uh, I don't know dated technology to uh, to do an overall evaluation they have made some improvements uh, just their overall water management plan as far as I've seen uh, has improved greatly over the past few years thank you Councillor Seymour Fragan Yes, thank you, and through you. Um, thanks for the presentation. I just have a really quick question because Councillor Elmsley asked many of the questions. Thank you. Um, so who's in charge of the entire operation? Who makes 
the call for everything from sandbagging to communications to all of that. Yes, uh, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council. You know, we have a collaborative approach. We have an operations uh, team. We work closely with Public Works. We work closely with all of our allied services. We work closely with communications. So, you know, we, we meet uh, uh, when, when things are, you know, um, in the thick of things on a, basically a daily basis, sometimes twice a day. And we plan out uh, the, the, the work for the coming days, the next day, what worked that day, uh, you know, any uh, unforeseen things that popped up any challenges and we're, we get better prepared for the next day, basically. So ultimately, the fire chief is in charge of the entire operation. You're the head of the operation. If, from an emergency planning perspective, um, the fire chief is responsible for emergency planning, but it depends on what the situation is. You know, um, if, it's a, if it's a flooded road, it's public works, right? If it is uh, people need to be evacuated, it's a human services um, with the assistance of, of, um, of uh, the Red Cross. If it is a, uh, you know, a propane emergency or somebody needs to be evacuated, uh, fire services will assist with paramedic services with doing that in the OPP. So it just depends on what the, what the actual call is. But overall, ultimately, emergency planning falls under the, uh, the division of fire services. And do we have an emergency preparedness plan? I know that tonine has been working on one, but is it finished? Uh, through uh, the Mayor to Council, now are you talking about the city emergency plan or the actual human services emergency plan for dealing with evacuees? Yes, the second part? Yeah. As far as I know, uh, human services is, uh, is working on that as we speak. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? We have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Uh, let's take a quick five-minute break. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate the update. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's take a quick five-minute break, and then we'll come back and deal with our second two presentations.
Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. We'll move into item 5.2, which is a presentation from the Halliburton Cortha Lakes Poverty Reduction Roundtable Update. Uh, Marina Hudson, Executive Director, Cortha North Family Health Team and Roundtable Co-Chair. That's quite a title. <laughs> and Rachel Giluli, did I pronounce that right? Poverty Reduction Coordinator. Welcome, ladies. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council for having us and providing us some time today. Um, so we just thought we'd take a moment of your time to update you on what's been going on in the past few years. I was here, I think, about three years ago. And um, as you can see from the slide, at this point, we're still looking at having um, approximately 13.5% of Kawartha Lakes households to be considered low income. <laughs> This includes 16.5% or 2,000 children between the ages of 0 and 17, as well as 10.7% or 1,915 adults over 65. 51.7% um, of people who rent houses in Kawartha Lakes unfortunately spend more than 30% of their income on their housing on shelter costs, which is considered to be unaffordable housing. And 13.5% of households are considered food insecure. Unfortunately, the income statistics are even more dire in Halliburton County. So recognizing that persistent poverty undermines the capacity for communities to flourish, the city of Kortha Lakes in Halliburton County embarked on reviewing and outlining poverty-related concerns in the five key areas which were presented to both the area councils. Um, the Poverty Reduction Roundtable formed in 2016 is comprised of community members including the nonprofit and business sectors, government, broader public services, the faith community, and any interest individuals with, with an interest in reducing poverty and or lived experience in the city of Kortha Lakes and Halliburton County. And actually, um, Councillor Elmsley, Zita Devan are regular attendees, um, as is Rod Sutherland and Hope Lee. Collectively, we work to raise awareness, share information, provide educational events, foster collaboration between various community stakeholders to develop poverty reduction initiatives and advocate for policies, programs, and services that address the root cause of poverty. The Roundtable has undertaken the implementation of the recommendations outlined in the poverty reduction strategies, along with smaller working groups that involve numerous other community partners which work to address each of the action plan areas. The poverty reduction strategy contained five action plans that targeted different areas playing a role in poverty reduction in the city of Kortha Lakes and county of Halliburton. These five action plans are closely interrelated as a disruption in any one of these areas will have an adverse effect on the other. As I'm sure you can appreciate, if you're already living in poverty and you have something that comes up, be it with your transportation or your childcare or your housing, everything else is going to fall into disarray. The complexity of and need for a multifaceted and interwoven approach to poverty reduction requires community-wide engagement reflected in the many organizations and individuals who make up the round table. So the first of our strategies focused on food security. Um, the Food Security Working Group in the Kawartha Lakes Food Coalition and its members implement various projects that address food insecurity. They developed a summer lunch outreach program under the Food Security Action Plan of Kawartha Lakes Food Coalition and the Poverty Reduction Strategies Food Security Action Plan, which supported and expanded the, food, the student nutrition programs during the school year and into the summer months. The purpose of the summer outreach program was to bridge the gaps between the summer months when school, schools are closed and students do not have access to the student nutrition program that is available in the schools during the school year. I think we heard from um, teachers and from parents and had feedback that kids are not looking forward to summer because they know that that means that there's going to be less food because the nutrition programs that they're currently accessing in the schools won't be running. And that's why we initially started that. The program is offered to elementary age students living in neighborhoods where there is a high density of poverty and schools reported concerns about food insecurity in their student population. Last year, the program was offered to students who attended King Albert and Queen Victoria Public Schools and St. Mary Catholic School in Lindsay. This year, the program expanded to include Leslie Frost, 
in Lindsay as well as Fenland Falls. Students interested in getting a free, nutritious brown bag lunch can go to the pickup sites, which are at each of the schools just mentioned, as well as Garnet Park in Fenland Falls. The summer lunch program is a partnership between the Food Security Group of Kawartha Lakes Food Coalition, the Salvation Army, the Food Source, and the Health Unit. These partners plan, coordinate, and implement the program as well as source and fund source the funding for the program. They also recruit many community volunteers who prepare and distribute the lunches. Um, we had a really good uptake and I think it was another successful year and we hope to continue the program and probably hopefully expand it further. The Food Security Pro Group of Kawartha Lakes Food Coalition has also done a lot of work to advocate the fed with the federal and provincial governments to develop policies and programs that take a comprehensive approach to address poverty and food security, including income security. Members of the committee participated on the Ministry of Social Services Basic Income Pilot Advisory Committee to support promotion and implementation of the pilot, which we all know what happened. It was uh, very, very excited to have that come to our community. And unfortunately, obviously, it was canceled by the current government. Following the cancellation, the group sent the provincial government a letter expressing deep concern and disappointment with the cancellation of the pilot and requested its continuation. Sample letters were also provided to community partners with the request they send letters to the provincial government advocating for the pilot to be reinstated and we had many people who did participate in that letter writing <coughs> campaign. In support of the mayor's request, uh, the working group also sent a letter to the federal government requesting they assume oversight of the pilot for year two and three of the study and met with MP Jamie Schmale to discuss the cancellation um, and how he could help with advocacy to the federal government to take on the completion of the pilot. As the government was in pre-budget consultations, MP Schmale encouraged the food security group of the Kawartha Lakes Food Coalition to send a letter to the Federal Minister of Finance requesting that the pilot be included in the 2019 budget plans. Letters were prepared and sent to the Federal Minister of Finance, Federal Minister of Social Services, and copied to the NDP Conservative Budget Critics and Ministry of Social Services Critics. Additionally, letters were prepared to the four mayors of pilot sites, including Mayor Latham, with an update on the working group's advocacy and requests that the mayor send a letter to the federal ministers of finance as well. The coalition also contacted the local, regional, and provincial partners and urged them to send letters requesting they also advocate for the basic income pilot to be taken over by the federal government. So I'd like to take a moment actually to thank the mayor for the support that he did provide at that time. And whilst we weren't successful, we do acknowledge and appreciate that, so thank you. We'd also like to highlight that food security working work aligns with new food policy and poverty reduction strategies for Canada. And if you thought my title was long, if you noticed some of the titles in that food coalition work, they're much longer than mine. Next was education and employment. Under the objectives of the Employment and Education Poverty Reduction Action Plan to address employment and to reduce poverty. Residents um, needed the skills and education to meet the labor force needs. Because we do still find that despite the fact that we say, you know, there's an issue with unemployment or underemployment, there's also an issue, especially in rural communities, with finding skilled workers to meet the needs that employers have, right? Um, Residents needed full-time, year-round employment and the supports that enable them to enter and remain in the labor market. It was decided amongst many community partners, such as VCSS, VCCS, <laughs> Human Services, the United Way, Job Quest, early on, the Health Unit, and King Albert Public School to pilot a three-week program that focused on rob job readiness skills. It was decided to pilot this program to parents whose children attended King Albert Public School, again, one of the schools that was also mentioned in the food pilot, um, um, given that it has a high incidence of people receiving social assistance. The United Way took the lead in this project, which focused on the barriers to employment, how to overcome these barriers, and other soft skills training. It also offered the Food Handlers course and Smart Serve. As these certifications increase, the likelihood of finding work in the food industry, which is often the entry point for many into employment. 
The pilot was held during the three-week period in the summer when children from the catchment area were attending the Ready for Kindergarten program and the summer learning program for children in grades one through three. It was felt this would be a good opportunity for parents to attend the Readiness for Employment program as many parents would be at the school to drop off and pick up their children for these summer programs, so not creating additional barriers related to childcare. Um, On-site childcare was provided free of charge to reduce barriers. The food handlers course was offered free of charge and SmartServe had a nominal fee, but, was, but if the person was on OW or ODSP, the cost would be covered throughout that program. Generally, the program was poorly attended, unfortunately, um, except for the food handlers course, which eight people completed. Um, only a few people were interested in the other components of this pilot, and anyone who expressed interest was provided one-on-one -on -one support instead because there wasn't sufficient numbers, unfortunately, to run it. And I think, you know, none of us like to feel like we're being criticized, and I think there was a perception that we're questioning people's ability to look after themselves and their families, and I think, you know, that's a hard thing to admit, right? So, next were children and youth. The working group recognized the long-term effects that poverty can have on children right from the moment of conception. The group's goals revolve around developing opportunities for securing optimal health, safe and affordable housing, optimal nutrition and levels of education, access to affordable and convenient transportation, and access for parents to secure employment and childcare. Early on, centers offer free, high-quality drop-in programs for families and children from birth to six years old. Since January of 2018, City of Kortha Lakes and the Early On Service Provider has, have focused on improving access to early on services. Over the first 15 months of the program, there have been five broad goals that have been pursued. Increasing summer programs, more Saturday programs, expanding weekly programs to more communities, enhancing the drop-in programs, and adding more hours of service. In 2018, summer programming was offered at all centers and Saturday programs are now available in both the city and the county. There are now early on drop-in programs being offered in 20 communities, including Bethany, Bob Cajun, Cardiff, Cobaconk, Dalton, Dorset, Fenland Falls, Gooderham, Halliburton, Janetville, Kinmount, Kirkfield, Lindsay, Little Britain, Minden, Norland, Omimi, Pontypool, Wilberforce, and Woodville. At a minimum, early on drop-in services are being offered at least twice per month at all of these locations. And I think it's important to recognize that sometimes we have wonderful services and wonderful programs, but they don't always reach the smaller communities, right? So a lot of times there's a focus on Lindsay with probably an outreach maybe in Fenland Falls and Bob Cajun, but communities outside of that often fall short. And if there's no transportation that the parents have access to, they're unable to access programs. So. In 2019, Early On is continuing to work on drawing attention to the programs and services, especially in our rural communities, and they're always looking for ways to improve engagement. The Early Learning Subcommittee of the Community Planning Table, a network of agencies that come together to discuss how they can better serve children in their early years, has a standing agenda item to discuss early on. Two current capital projects will add 20 infant spaces, 20 toddler spaces, and eight preschool spaces in 2020. Over the past several years, there have been approximately seven new licensed home child providers in our area. Licensed home child care is an important piece in the child care expansion puzzle. While it may not be feasible for a child care center to operate in a small rural community, licensed home providers can fill an important need for families seeking child care in those communities. Licensed home providers also provide a different option for families when seeking child care, and I think a big issue that can be overcome by those privately run in-home providers is the hours of operation, right? So a lot of the people that are looking for the childcare spots aren't working nine to five, Monday to Friday, and having only access to childcare on those times isn't feasible and not realistic to meet their needs. There also continues to be an ongoing issue attracting and retaining registered early childhood educators within the childcare and early learning sector more effort is required to find local solutions to this problem. Having said that, I think there's a recognition that the funding is not always available to compensate them at a level that makes it an attractive option, especially in our communities. Um, next is housing. So the issues around affordable housing are being addressed by a number of community partners. 
throughout the city of Crothall Lakes and Halliburton County. And I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge all the work that's been done at the city level and the county level to uh, increase housing stock. And while I think we still have a long way to go, it's certainly recognized and appreciated all the effort that has been made. Um, the housing working group is very much influenced by a number of pre-existing committees operating across the city of Kortha Lakes and Halliburton County, including access to permanent housing, whose mandate is to bring together service providers, organizations, and individuals interested in working on increasing affordable housing in this region. The housing action plan emphasizes the links between affordable housing, personal health, and community economic development with current focus on the review of the 10-year housing and homelessness plan. This has led to an increased supply of housing in Lindsay, Minden, and Halliburton Village. The development of a housing help model that provides support and resources for re residents experiencing housing insecurity, as well as the establishment of a homelessness response strategy which included joining the 20K Homes Campaign to end chronic homelessness in Canada. Next is transportation, always an ongoing issue at these meetings, I'm sure. The transportation working group was divided into two subgroups as transportation issues for Halliburton County and the city of Kortha Lakes are regionally specific and require separate approaches. In the city of Kortha Lakes, the transportation working group elected to focus its efforts on bringing rural transportation to Kortha Lakes to facilitate travel to and from employment, education and medical appointments, to increase opportunities for intercommunity shopping and to allow for more convenient travel across the Kortha Lakes region. A rural transportation summit was held in Fenland Falls in conjunction with the Lindsay Transit Advisory Board to obtain transportation strategies with public input and an action plan was launched at an event on Omimi. And if any of you event, attended the Fenland Falls event, I can say it was really well attended and I think was very successful. The working group's action plan was presented to Kortha Lakes Council and unanimously received. However, Council declined city staff's recommendation to apply for rural new transportation grants from the province and resolved not to take action specifically on rural transit for the next several years. The working group helped facilitate two test runs of a weekly shopping shuttle to excellent public and media feedback and ridership began at nearly 100 residents and almost doubled during the second test run. Next steps to regularize, regularize, I'm not sure that's a word, ma'am. <laughs> this service, I didn't write this by the way. <laughs> Rachel did the lovely job. The service are promoting and engaging with the private sector owners of the shuttle. Um, the shuttle had the support of Bob Cajun, Lindsay, and Fenland Falls Chambers of Commerce. Um, the weekly shopping shuttle began regular operations every Tuesday with a route that encompasses communities throughout the city of Kortha Lakes. It's an excellent development, and by January 2019, the shuttle had reported 4,500 riders. Moving forward, the Transportation Working Group will continue to work on coordinating a central rideshare resource, encouraging increased home delivery by local stores, example groceries and pharmacies, and focusing on the development of more active transportation infrastructure. In addition to the working group activities, the roundtable was able to secure funding from the Ontario Trillium Foundation and recruited three individuals to receive training to run the Bridges Out of Poverty workshops in Halliburton and the city of Kortha Lakes. The workshop is a framework for understanding poverty designed to increase the understanding of, and to improve one's ability to work with individuals living in poverty. They, the focus is on hidden rules of economic class and providing strategies to have relationships at the individual level and improve outcomes at an organizational level. We've had seven workshops thus far in Bob Cajun, Lindsay, Bethany, and Minden on a cost recovery basis with great engagement, attendance, and feedback from the community members. I think we've had 181 participants. And three more workshops are scheduled to take this place in Minden, Burnt River, and Lindsay. We also had a specific, two I think specific um, workshops targeted at faith groups and um, looking at poverty from the pews, I think it was what it was called, which I think have been really successful in connecting us further to those individuals. So moving forward, we're going to run the getting ahead in a just getting by world for persons who are living in poverty. Um, so that will be a multi-week course 
that we're hoping to run in two segments in one workshop in um, Halliburton County and one in the city of Cortha Lakes with six participants at each and there is uh, actually an incentive for the participants so that they have some cost recovery for their travel time so they do get gift cards to attend. We're looking to have stakeholder engagement in poverty reduction issues and to review and update the action plans. So that brings us to why we're really here and how you can help to support us on an ongoing basis. So we would ask that you continue to invest in more affordable and supportive high quality housing, create more mixed neighborhoods with diverse housing options and invest in programs for home repairs, improved energy efficiency and increased accessibility. We would like to see an increase in the number of licensed childcare spaces, which is still an ongoing concern, as well as the support of subsidized, no-cost and low-cost recreational opportunities, library programs and community events for children and their families. The support and to create employment and business opportunities and address the barriers to employment and job skills training opportunities, such as having childcare or having no transportation. Um, establish a rural transportation model that connects our communities, and invest in active transportation infrastructures, such as bike and pedestrian paths and paved shoulders. And lastly, to advocate for policies and programs that address the root causes of food insecurity and to support the innovative community food initiatives. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation, appreciate that. Um, We'll get a motion to receive. We'll see if there's any questions. Councillor uh, O'Reilly and Ashmore. Um, Councillor Elmsley, you have a question. No, Mr. Mayor, I have a comment. I want to thank Marina and the whole Poverty Reduction Roundtable. They're a very dedicated group who meet regularly and the meetings are always well attended. They're well run and ideas come forward at a rapid rate that are acted on, that are um, looked after. We have uh, very able support from city staff, from Mr. Sutherland and his, uh, uh, his team. And uh, it, it is really a, a wonderful group to belong to and, and they do great work and I'm happy to be part of it and I'm thankful to the city for the support they give and I hope we can find a way to continue to support them and to uh, move forward with some of uh, the, the things they need to have happen in order to be successful. So just a big thank you. That's the easiest question you'll have all day, right? Any other questions or comments for the deputant? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you for coming today and sharing your concerns. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, we'll move right into item 5.3, which is our last presentation regarding affordable housing targets. Uh, Hope Lee, Manager of Human Services. Welcome, Hope. Thanks. Uh, Mayor, members of council, I'm happy to be here today um, to present uh, a little bit of information that relates uh, to the report that you have on your agenda about um, adopting affordable housing targets and supporting um, an affordable housing initiative uh, policy. If I can get this to move, oops. Uh, so the city is the designated service manager for both the city of Kawartha Lakes and the county of Halliburton. Uh, the Housing Services Act requires that service managers have a plan to address housing and homelessness. The first plan um, was required in 2014 for a minimum of 10 years. And the act requires a periodic review every five years of that plan. Uh, the city and county adopted the first plan in 2014, and that plan covered a period of 2014 to 2023. Um, and it's actually in its final stages of periodic review, and that review is due no later than December 31st of this year. 
So a project coordinating committee has actually been working uh, through reviewing the plan. Um, they've created a draft plan. They've com completed multiple forms of uh, public consultation and they've published a comprehensive uh, needs analysis to accompany the uh, actual uh, housing and homelessness plan. So the one final consideration to complete the plan is really setting affordable housing targets. Um, so the number of affordable uh, units that the city and county will aim uh, to achieve over the term of the next plan. Um, and that term will be 2020 to 2029. So while other city and county plans and strategies may be overarching for residents in all income brackets, uh, the housing and homelessness plan and the focus of the work of the service manager in both the city and county really focuses uh, specifically on the low to moderate or middle income households. Um, the recommended targets apply to the category that fall within the focus of the plan and which meet the council approved definition of affordable housing uh, for both the city and county. Um, so those targets are to strive to create housing, both rental and ownership, where the rent or the accommodations cost would not exceed 30% of gross annual household income for those low to income house, moderate income households. And when we talk about low to moderate income households, that's those households that are at or below the 60th uh, percentile of income. So this, uh, the next two slides kind of show a local assessment of what uh, low income and what moderate or middle income look like uh, for the city of Kawartha Lakes. Um, so for instance, you can um, see on the left-hand side in the city, that would mean a renter with an income at or below 22,800 who could afford an affordable rent at or below uh, $570. Um, and income of owners at or below 46.5 who could afford a house price at or below 164.9. Um, kind of the same scenario for moderate or middle income. So they're at the 30th to 60th percentile. Um, so incomes between 22.8, 42.1 for renters, affording a rent that's no more than $1,050 and owner's incomes no more than 84.6 with a house price that would max out at just about $300,000. Um, so it's really um, important to understand that as the targets are being established, um, when we talk about each additional uh, unit, we're not always talking about the result of new construction. So affordable units uh, can be created in a variety of ways. Um, it can look at the resale of existing ownership. It can look at a subsidy to a tenant uh, in, in a existing market rental uh, situation. It can look at the rehabilitation of spaces that aren't currently <laughs> residential rental or are inhabitable. Um, it even looks at the secondary suite um, and residents creating uh, that <laughs> that second dwelling uh, within their own home, and then of course purpose-built uh, rental and ownership. So some key considerations as we move towards achieving the targets. Um, there is continued ongoing and sustainable uh, funding and policy support needed at all three levels of government. So not only here at the municipal level, uh, but federally and provincially as well. Um, it's very difficult to uh, build affordable housing, um, so there is the realization that partners can't, be, can't create those units um, for us without some kind of level of either funding or uh, policy support. Um, it's really going to take the participation of many uh, partners, so private developers, community housing providers, affordable housing uh, providers, community agencies, uh, residents in creating those secondary suites, um, and municipal staff in, in supporting um, and encouraging uh, these units to be developed. And then there's also the continued and ongoing education and information for all potential partners. So we need to 
uh, regularly advertise the need and what assistance is needed and available. Um, keep the message uh, current. Uh, we need to help partners understand how they can contribute. And we also need to hear back from partners on uh, what's standing in the way for them helping, to us, helping us to meet these targets. Um, so in both the city and county, the majority of new housing starts each year continue to focus on detached homes for the ownership market. Um, there's also the uh, ongoing resale market. However, it really provides very limited options uh, for that low to moderate income uh, bracket. So while there's really no method, no formal method to establish targets for ownership, um, we are considering three different approaches to help encourage um, that there is some ownership available to that low and middle income uh, bracket. Um, so in the resale market, we wanna continue to uh, support individuals who may not be able to come up with that down payment assistance but are ready to move from rental um, to ownership. So when we have funding available, um, we should definitely be uh, considering that program in both the city and county. Um, under new construction, um, the city and county will, will establish some policies to ensure there's some op options available. Um, this can be done through uh, different policies or plans of the city. And then, of course, um, actively pursuing ownership options with nonprofits uh, like Habitat for Humanity. Um, so certainly the, the lack of uh, purpose-built uh, rental has been and continues to be a concern in both the city and county. Uh, the vacancy rate has remained low for several years as supply isn't keeping up with demand. And really the continued focus of single detached homes making up uh, the majority of living spaces will only accelerate um, our already uh, critical rental housing situation. So as part of uh, the Housing and Homelessness uh, Plan review, the city engaged Org Code uh, Consulting, who are known nationally for their uh, housing uh, forecasting model. So that model is sensitive to two dozen uh, current and historical variables, uh, which really paints us a really good picture of what's needed and by when. Um, so although org code uh, did generate three models for establishing uh, targets, rental targets for the city and county, um, we are recommending uh, the ideal model. Um, so the ideal model um, will look at the overall need in the context of identifying the volume of housing needed by dwelling size and the number of units will increase significantly to be able to meet the, the demand over the next 10 years. So that recommended uh, model would be used uh, in working towards ensuring there were options uh, for the low income, the middle income, and the supportive. So you can see uh, the breakdown between uh, those three categories uh, for the city and county. Um, so as mentioned previously, partnerships are really key to these uh, additional affordable uh, units. In order to plan and provide some direction in achieving the targets, some additional internal analysis has resulted in us uh, further defining the targets into types of partners um, that will hopefully come to the table and assist us in, in meeting those goal targets. Um, so KLH Housing has been a key contributor in developing new affordable housing over the past uh, several years. Um, this model you see uh, anticipates that KLH will continue um, to increase its contribution over the next 10 years. Um, by having KLH develop um, and the city being the shareholder, um, the affordability period um, for all of the units uh, built under KLH uh, will be for the life of the asset, will, where other partners may be a shorter affordability period. Um, KLH as well will probably um, assist with the majority of the low income and that supportive um, income category that we looked at on the previous slide. So the balance of the new construction is anticipated to come equally 
um, through either existing nonprofits or private market uh, partners. Um, this too, the private market includes those residents creating secondary suites, um, de developers of purpose-built rental apartments, um, or even units through the rehabilitation of buildings. Um, so the expectation of the private market participation is really unknown at this time, so that's why it's reflected as a, as a smaller percentage. Um, private developers are and really continue to be reluctant to develop affordable housing um, for a variety of reasons. Um, the key one being the lower profit margin um, that they receive from building affordable housing. Um, and another significant one is the current uh, landlord and tenant uh, board law. Um, so while we have uh, the policy direction in place to support and encourage them to do so, uh, the uptake um, will certainly uh, be the challenge here. Um, also just to note to date, there's really no overarching legislation that councils can uh, rely on to require private developers to develop affordable housing. Um, and then the last uh, way to uh, build or to have additional units created um, is that subsidy um, column. Um, it's either providing um, direct subsidy to landlords through rent supplement or through housing allowances um, or some kind of portable um, allowance where residents take it um, to a unit of their choice. Um, so providing municipal incentives to, to encourage new construction and rehabilitation will assist in a variety of ways. Um, we saw a variety of uh, different recommendations in the council approved affordable housing uh, framework. Um, so they were such things as the provision of land, so either donation of municipal land, lease, uh, or below market value, uh, either reduced or deferred property tax, um, exemptions from securities, for example, um, site plan securities, um, and then a number of other uh, fees and charges that are related to development, like building permit fees, development charges, um, parkland levies, etc. cetera. Um, so this, the report on your agenda also recommends a council policy that would identify any incentive that the city or county uh, could provide. Along with the lists, levels would be included to assist the proponent in understanding what the city or county uh, would expect in return. Uh, so for example, if the incentives equaled $15,000 per unit, uh, we might say that that unit had to be at an 80% uh, rent level for a period of 10 years. That's just a, an example. Um, the policy will assist partners or proponents to identify which items apply to their development, uh, which incentives apply to their development situation, um, how does the value of the incentives impact the development um, so for example, like I talked about, what will the rent amounts be that are expected? What is the term of affordability? Um, and does it result in a financial uh, plan for them that uh, allows them to partner and create um, some of the units we need to meet targets? Um, there will also be an expression of interest uh, process. Um, so this will allow us to establish what the value of those incentives are that the partners are asking for. Um, so it could be the cost of any fee or charge, um, the value of a relief from security, the estimated value of any type of reduced or deferred property tax, the market value of any land uh, being donated. So then municipal budgets would incorporate the values of these requests and then once the budget and project were approved, the full value of the municipal incentives are actually itemized within what we call a municipal housing facilities agreement, and the total amount of those incentives are registered on title. And then that agreement and the overarching municipal housing facilities uh, bylaw is the authority to provide any of those incentives, including um, land, property tax, fees, charges, even uh, cap capital grants. 
and it really outlines the obligations of both parties, including the affordability uh, period, and then it gives us the ability, if that is breached, to be able to request the proponent to repay um, the value of those incentives. Um, so just in conclusion, um, I want to say that the definition of a target is an object or goal that is being aimed for. Um, the affordable housing targets the council is being asked to adopt today are the additional units that the city and county will aim for over the next 10 years. Um, the city and county will not achieve these goals without a variety of partners. There is no expectation that the entire cost of any or all of these units will be the responsibility of the city or county on its own. Uh, residents, uh, residents will become partners by creating secondary suites in newer existing homes. Developers of ownership and rental units can contribute by making some of their new units affordable and landlords of existing market rental can partner with the service manager for rent supplement. It really is too complex to calculate the actual municipal cost in order to achieve these targets at this point. Um, we'll see fluctuations in the types of partners and the types of projects uh, that will be brought forward annually through the um, expression of interest. And by, by receiving those annually, it will really give municipalities um, the ability to consider um, the cost of those incentives, realizing that affordable housing is only one of the municipal uh, priorities um, that you have to consider. Um, what is required is a commitment of all three levels of government to assist. So while municipalities can look at ways um, to fund these projects, either through uh, budgets, long-term financial plans, uh, or DC reserves. The National Housing Strategy will provide access to various funding and financing, and the province has already committed to cost matching in the National Housing um, Strategy funding um, so that service managers do have funding allocations that they can um, also contribute to helping uh, meet those targets. So that's it, and thanks for your time. Thank you. Your presentation. We'll get a motion to receive the presentation, Councillor Elmsley and Dunn. Councillor Elmsley, you have a question or a comment? Question this time, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Hope. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, just, I don't know if you have the answer or maybe Director Marshall might. Where are we with the bylaw for uh, secondary suites outside of Lindsay? Do you have any idea? Uh, through the mayor, uh, it's my understanding that secondary suites uh, is part of the zoning bylaw consolidation. I know there was talk of looking at uh, secondary suites individually, um, but I'm not aware that, that there has been any work done on it as a sort of separate topic up to date. So the consolidated bylaw won't be with us until sometime in 2020? Uh, through the mayor, uh, th that's correct. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Riley? Uh, thank you, um, just a quick one, to, a couple of quick ones to hope. Uh, on the down payment assistance program, has there been much uptake on that? Yeah, through the mayor to the councillor, um, that's one of our most attractive programs. We've helped uh, probably a hundred households um, move into ownership. Um, it did slow down a bit when some of the mortgage rules um, changed, but it still is a very attractive program. And the uh, st status of the national housing uh, program. Do you have any update on that? Uh, as far as I know, it's still there and plugging along for us. So <laughs> I, I won't comment what might happen after October. But <laughs> yeah. 
Any further questions on our housing? Wow, you guys understand it better than I do. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, do you know what the average, I'm just gonna be honest with you, Hope, I'm struggling with these numbers, um, and not the need for these numbers. I'm struggling with the budget, unknown budget impl um, implications of making a commitment. I understand there's other levels and that you can't put a funding number to it, but to me, that's a hard decision for council to make a targeted commitment without knowing what those, you know, we have other priorities, as you mentioned before, so how do we balance that if we don't know what it's gonna cost? So um, I'm struggling with that part of it. Do you know what the average number of units that we've built for affordable housing over the past 10 years? I mean, we're, we're looking at a target here of 200 a year for the next 10 years. So can you give me a ballpark of what we've maybe averaged over the past 10 years? Uh, so just looking at KLH, I can um, tell you that we've been developing around 20 to 30 uh, units a year, um, not really aggressively developing either, right? Looking at a aggressive model. Um, I, I'd have to go back and look at, we've also been uh, quite successful with uh, rent supplement, so there's been a, a number of new rent supplement and there's been a number of uh, portable benefits established as well. So if I had to say on average, we're probably creating 40 to 50 new units a year. So, yeah. Okay. And this is a pretty aggressive target of 200 per year. Um, Again, I'm struggling with the financial, you know, are we making a financial commitment that, are we writing a check we can't afford to write right now? And please don't, I know the need is there. I know we're trying to get ahead of the need. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm struggling, you know, with that aggressive um, commitment that you're asking this council to make. Uh, when you talked earlier about the 15,000, you're just putting out numbers, subsidy to subsidize a housing unit, who pays, who would cover that cost? When you say a 15,000 subsidy on a, on, a, on a housing unit, is that a municipal cost that we would be subsidizing through incentives? Is that what you're talking about when you sort of come up with that 50? Is that to a builder? Is that, I'm, I'm, just explain that to me if you would. Yeah, so there are different ways to offer incentives. So some of it will be a municipal cost. Um, so maybe I can use a, a past KLH project as an example. Um, so the majority of the funding came through uh, federal provincial uh, program funding. Um, and then the municipality provided incentives. So um, development charges, building permit fees, um, connection fees, um, not having to provide securities. Um, and then they also um, assist KLH with the debt servicing. So at the end, the amount of debt that has to be taken out um, is secured by the city as a debenture, and then the revenues of the project cover the cost of those. So um, that's why I say it's really complex to look at it. Um, for example, secondary suites, um, multi-unit rehabilitation, um, the home ownership, down payment assistance, um, that capital up front um, to um, uh, new rental buildings um, could potentially all come from federal, provincial dollars. Um, so municipalities may just be looking at those incentives of waiving um, development charges, waiving building permit fees. Um, the rent supplement right now is more of a municipal cost. So for example, um, an average subsidy um, to provide that rent supplement is around $500 a month. Um, so that would be an ongoing operating um, cost of the municipality. Um, I think some of the things you have to look at as well too is that the municipality is looking for um, different ways to fund affordable housing. So right now as we're working through the 
um, the DC uh, bylaw, we're looking at including affordable housing, so collecting DC revenues to be able um, to, to generate a reserve that would help offset some of the cost of that as well. Okay, so when we waive, I guess where I'm trying to get my head around, and you're right, it's, it's fairly complicated and probably more so for me. Um, when we're waiving fees like development charges and building permits, we're not really waiving them. We're, we're pushing them off onto another, there's still costs that the city's incurring. And, and that's, you know, again, it's, I get what we're trying to accomplish, but I'm very concerned about the direction this province is going in the next couple of years and the pressure that's gonna put on our municipality. Number one, we'll have to deal with that, but their commitments that they've made for affordable housing uh, moving forward, how they're going to pay for it, which I'm not sure they know at this point either. Um, when we set targets for affordable housing, does that get in, maybe it's a direct for the, does that get included in our asset management plan moving forward? Like when we set a target that for X number of units, I understand we're not building them all new, but is there a portion of that that would automatically go into our asset management plan, which would automatically affect our DC charges because we have to charge more for DCs to sort of cover the cost of that. I mean, is there, you know, is there a real effect to, to, to that or am I, or am I right offline here? You're not offline. Um, the, DC, the DCs, the new updated DC bylaw that will be coming forward does include a component for um, housing. Um, I appreciate Hope's comments that it is difficult because we don't know what the uptake will be. Um, and ultimately it will come back to what's, af what's affordable when council looks at all the other priorities and how much tax dollars there are available, how much of that do you want to invest in social housing? So we would come forward with some recommendations on that when we bring forward the long-term plan. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I'm just, I'm, as being part of the DC task force, I'm, I'm seeing these plans that we're adopting these, um, I don't know what you call them, plans that we're adopting for fire and, and, and everything else, housing. And there's a cost to those because they're being included in our, you know, our asset management moving forward. And our DC costs are going up because of some of these plans that are just plans and they're not realistic for us to achieve in some instances. And yet we have, we're obligated to start recovering some of these costs. And as our DC costs go up for residential units, you know, that cost gets passed on from builders to homeowners and we're making the housing more affordable on this end of this, more unaffordable on this end of the spectrum. So I'm not saying we should or we shouldn't. I'm just sort of trying to get my head around the whole scope of some of these decisions we make here when we try to find that balance with a, a very limited pot of, of, of funds moving forward. So I'll be quiet now. I've generated some other questions, so that's good. Councillor Dunn, go ahead. I was just waiting for the act, that part to come up. I thought we were, I thought we were just receiving the report. Um, so as far as receiving the report, I have no issue. It's a, it's a good report. Um, a lot of what's in there, uh, in my opinion, is not attainable. Um, right off the bat, 1,300 of those units, uh, because we have to look at the entire management area, 1,300 of those units um, are going to be supported by rent subsidies. Um, I don't think I don't think we have. 1,300 units. I don't anticipate having 1,300 landlords or 1,300 units become available over the next 10 years based on just based on my own observations uh, where people are going to be prepared to take on affordable housing. Like that's where my concerns are uh, because that uh, that uh, focuses on the um, uh, the private market being available and right now <clears throat> there's nothing available at the private market. So to find someone to take on rent subsidies, which is even more of an aggravation than, than just going out at market value, uh, I, think, I think that's gonna be, you know, not just the cost to the city taxpayer to provide the subsidies, uh, but also the availability of uh, rentors to accept the subsidies, I think is, is, a, is a major challenge. Uh, the, only, um, uh, the only solace I take from this report, and we had the discussion at the housing meetings, is that, uh, that these are very aggressive targets. Uh, I don't expect that 10 years from now we're gonna reach those targets, but I also have no problem of setting the goal high uh, and accepting the fact that we did everything to get there. So um, 
but I'm 100% on side. Uh, what we're asking uh, our community to do and what we'll end up doing, I think, are going to be two totally different, uh, two totally different things. I don't by lowering expectations. I don't know if we get there any quicker. So that's just my comments. Thank you, Councillor Riley. I guess I was any questions for hope as well. While no, she's no, here, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, on the same line. To your yeah. point, it's just to receive. So yeah, it's just the anticipation of targets. Uh, we, I know we have to set targets, as Councillor John has said, so I, and whether realistic or we feel as though they are unrealistic. Uh, that's just basically what it is, an expectation that we're going to, uh, it, well, hope an expectation we make, because everyone in this room would like to, I'm sure would like to make those targets, but uh, um, by setting these, that uh, was there a lot of um, thought got into whether they're realistic or not realistic, or? Yeah, so through the mayor to the council, um, Yes, they are realistic, right? They were created um, through a modeling forecast that looks at 24 different data points. Um, so it's looking at a local assessment of our community to develop those rental targets. Um, you're right, um, like numerous uh, what have said, it is a target, a target is a goal. Um, and. I'd be hopeful that we would achieve a, a good portion of those. Um, I think right now what you're looking at is a, is a community um, where partners are out there that potentially haven't come to the table, maybe because we haven't done a good job at saying what's available, what do we need, what can we provide you to come to the table, what do you need from us um, to help. It's been said it's just the unknown of the uh, climate, both federally and provincially, going forward. That is a bit of a wild card as well. Thank you. Any further questions for Hope? We'll get a motion to receive, or we have it. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you very much. Don't go too far away. We might have more questions. Um, so we'll move into item 6.1.1, which is the uh, the affordable housing targets report. Um, as Hope mentioned. Uh, they're recommending the ideal model, which is the aggressive model, um, and that the policy attached uh, entitling, entitled affordable housing incentives uh, be adopted and put into the corporate policy. So I don't know what Council wants to do. Councillor Helmsley? Well, like everybody else, I do have uh, concerns about the aggressive targets. I also think that, you know, reaching high is a good thing. And I, I am disappointed that the uh, bylaw allowing secondary suites hasn't come forward by now, because I do think that that will go a long way towards helping us achieve those goals over the next 10 years. So being a, an optimist, I will give you a motion as printed. So as printed that the affordable housing targets be received, that the affordable ownership and rental targets, the ideal model processes to encourage them outlined in the report be adopted, and that the policy entitled affordable housing incentives appended to re this report be adopted, numbered, inserted in the corporate policy manual and be forwarded to the next council meeting? That's correct. Seconder? Councillor Dunn? Do you want to speak to it? I don't think I can improve on what Hope said in her presentation, and I think we understand the challenges that are facing us. Um, but I also think, the need, as you pointed out, the need is there, and I, with appropriate partners, it will be a stretch. But I think we can probably get there over the next 10 years. I, I, and based on all of those things. Um, I, I'm willing to move it uh, for that reason. Thank you. Councillor Dunn, do you want to speak to it? I like the, uh, the incentives. I think it's going to encourage the not-for-profits. I'm not too, too sure that the public sector will get involved, but uh, I think the, the incentives are there that the not-for-profits will probably uh, take advantage of it when they can. So I think the incentives are good incentives. Uh, and I recognize it's just a, it's, it, it's, it's still our money. It's still tax money. It's tax money that we're not going to receive. But um, 
I don't know, I've always had that feeling money that didn't go into my pocket doesn't hurt as much as money that I'm taking out of my pocket. So uh, I think they're good incentives and I think we should uh, support it. No, it's all been said. I think as long as we just have it in our mind that it's great to set targets, but uh, I know we have many other needs and I think there's a lot of uncertainties, but uh, we certainly know the need in our community. But uh, hopefully with the um, with our uh, comprehensive zoning bylaw coming forward and not only the basement apartments, maybe there may be a couple other areas that we can improve upon. So we can uh, hopefully reach to, to the best of our ability to the target anyways. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Councillor Ashmore? I just uh, was wondering if we could have a friendly amendment that that bylaw that was going to come forward, that report would come in the first quarter of 2020 from Development Services that we've been waiting for to do with for the, the uh, secondary flats, uh, granny flat. Well, we'll That's sort of, I mean, do that as a follow up if you want to try and go there. But you'll. Do you want to clarify just on the yeah, that, side? Sure. The secondary suite. Yep. Sorry, so through you, Mr. Mayor, so a little bit of confusion. So the secondary suites are now permitted in our zoning bylaws in our urban areas. The policy was also established by a previous council. The exercise right now to expand that uh, permission as of right throughout the entire city now. And that uh, policy issue needs to be resolved through our uh, secondary plans, official plan work uh, that's in front of the board. So once that's done and in alignment with that concurrent, the rural zoning bylaw consolidation, which is the exercise, would then allow those uses, assuming that that's the direction council wants to go uh, as of right in the zoning. So uh, accelerating it, we're not able to do that until it catches up sort of with the legislation, if you will, to allow them more broadly. But you're already permitted to have secondary suites in urban areas uh, by zoning. I certainly am confused then because as far as I know, the only place we have secondary suites is in Lindsay. I do not know of any secondary suites that have been approved for any urban areas outside of Lindsay. So through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I would suggest you're absolutely right. We're not getting very many formal building permits to build secondary suites because of some of the conditions and requirements, um, but they're out there. And I would suggest that there's secondary suites uh, in all of our urban areas some of them may have not have gone through a building permit process uh, and formalized. But they, from a zoning perspective only, they are right now permitted as a, a secondary use uh, within a residential suite. Okay. Director, you have a comment? Just to clarify, I think what Councillor Elmsey is referring to is that in the uh, town of or in the Fenelon Falls zoning bylaw, there are restrictions on secondary suites. Um, but I think that was due to flooding issues historically um, that, that that was put in, but it's an historic zoning bylaw I issue. And I think that's what he's referring to specifically. So yes, secondary suites predominantly throughout the, the city in the urban areas are permitted through zoning, but unfortunately in Fenelon Falls, that's not the case. And I think that's what he was referring to in looking at policies or doing some work outside of the zoning bylaw consolidation uh, to update the Fenelon Falls zoning bylaw, which doesn't permit the secondary suites at this point. Well, that really cleared it up. <laughs> Are you good, Councillor Ashmore? All right. Let's go back to the original motion, which is affordable housing targets, okay? The motion as printed. If you want to do a follow-up motion, you can do a follow-up. Let's deal with this first. Um, so the motion is as printed. Is, is everybody clear on the motion? Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. 
Are you still looking at a follow-up motion for secondary suites? It doesn't seem like we need to uh, pursue that at this time. Agree? Okay. Thank you. Hope oh. um, and all. So 612 uh, is the promote proposed amendments to the high bill adjustment policy. Uh, we had this meeting a while ago. We went through some recommendations. Uh, pretty much brought forward. I don't know if, uh, Director, you want to give us a 30-second update. It's pretty well spelled out. Some of the things we talked about have been incorporated into the new policy. Is there anything you want to add or no? Nope. Is there anything is it matches what I think we were all looking for? You'll move it as printed? Uh, Councillor Dunn, so that the proposed amendments to the high water bill adjustment policy be received and the proposed amendments to the high water bill attached as appendix A to this report be brought forward for council for approval September 24th. You'll move that, you'll second that, Councillor O'Reilly. Any further questions or comments? I think it uh, gets us where we need to be. All in favor? That's passed, thank you. Um, 613 is the capital close. Uh, I'm not going to read the motion because it's huge, so it's in front of you. Uh, it's about closing off our capital projects and some extensions and just sort of an update on, on where we are on a lot of our projects. Is there, Councillor Elmsley? As printed. Sorry, as printed? Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Yo. Any questions or comments on anything in it? All in favor? That's passed. Thank you to Nicole Owens. Is Nicole here? No? Thank you. Please pass that on. Noise bylaw, 614. Uh, Aaron Sloan is here, our manager of municipal law enforcement. Uh, this is an update that's been ongoing for a while. Is there anything, Aaron, you want to give us a 30 second update on, or it's all spelled out here? You're available for questions. Through to the mayor to council, there's just one uh, in the report. Oh, yeah. We uh, had to make one or point out one modification that we made uh, that didn't make the, uh, the final version that was attached to the amendment, and that's the section uh, 503. The uh, bylaw, as attached to the report, is correct, uh, but the report just uh, should read uh, just directed to council as the final sentence. So this is just clarifying some yep. of the multi-day events. Is that the one? Yes. 503 the one. that extend over three days and really that they need to be directed by council and it said committee of the whole. We've taken off committee of the whole. It's to council. Basically so. the same process that's in place now. Okay. Uh, sounds good. So there's some changes to it. Everybody's had a read. Uh, does anybody want to move it as printed? Councillor Elmsley? I have a question first. You have a question first? Go ahead. Through you to... Uh Manager Sloan, uh, we talk about uh, require payment of fees for services and activities schedule A12 to be amended to establish an exemption fee. How does that work? If, if people want an exemption from the noise bylaw, we're going to charge them? Through the mayor to the councillor, uh, yes, that's correct. Um, we're, we're providing a service, we're reviewing um, an exemption request, uh, so it's just a fee to offset that service. And what would, like, for everything? Or? Uh, just for the exemption requests. So, Canada Day Fireworks, as an example, we would charge a fee for it? For exempting them from the noise bylaw? I believe. I think, Aaron, you've mirror. got licensed fireworks events are already exempt. It's, There's it's a whole list of regulated. stuff that are yes. currently yes. exempt, fairs, a lot of okay. stuff that we know is going to be outside the noise bylaw. They're already exempt. This is just for somebody who wants to put on a private event or a wedding and exempt the noise bylaw. There's going to be a fee for anything outside of the normal exemptions. Okay. Thank you. So you're still going to move it as printed? Thank you. Councillor Yo, you'll second it? With a question, go ahead. Uh, through you to, to the manager. Um, I've had a couple of complaints this year regarding ongoing use of generators. 
um, on properties that basically the hydro has been cut off. So it's not an emergency use, it's a, it's a use of neglect from the owner to not fix up their property and get hydro reconnected. So how does any changes in this bylaw that reflect um, what the rights of the property owners around these people can do? I know that I saw that you can only run up for one hour in every four hour period and stuff. So is that the extent of the uh, enforcement? Through to mirror to uh, the councillor, uh, yeah, so in Schedule B we uh, do specifically address that um, and we've regulated around uh, a time period. So that is the change? Yes. Okay, Councillor Riley? Just uh, through to you, I saw in the report um, we've had um, some calls recently and not a large number of calls about noisy vehicles within the town. I see that it didn't really sound like the decibel way was the way we we're going to be able to address it is uh, do you have any thoughts or suggestions if uh, continue to get calls or, or is there kind of a threshold when enough calls or enough call or I, I know it's an awkward situation but uh, it wasn't uh, it feels though that uh, you felt as though it was a need this time to address it would that be accurate uh, through the mayor to council um, vehicles on the roadway is one of the things that we considered um, in the rewrite of the bylaw. It, it's currently in there. Um, it's problematic for enforcement for me directly because I don't have the authority to stop the vehicles. Um, however, I wanted to leave it in because it's a lesser offense uh, than the offense under the Highway Traffic Act and the local police services, they have the ability to provide full enforcement of that. Is that uh, answered? That's close enough. I've also mentioned to the other police services board they're aware of it as well. Yeah, and we can we can also work on coordinated coordinated programs uh, with them. So you know if they want to pull the people over, we can you know stand on the side and, and help them out in that way. So. Or you could just put a new muffler on your car, and you won't have that problem. <laughs> Question, Councillor Elmsley, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Um, there's times in there for loading and unloading of trucks. How does that affect like grocery stores who receive their produce in the middle of the night? Are they not allowed to do that? Or do they have an exemption or what happens? Through the mayor to the councillor, um, there's no specific exemptions uh, for those. They, there may be, uh, um, conversations that take place. We have had a number of complaints over the years. Um, the grocery retailers are, are very good at uh, the ones that we've dealt with at addressing the concerns. Um, most deliveries do occur within uh, c compliance to the, uh, the hours in the bylaw. But there are occasions. There are occasions, and, and like I say, it's, it's a complaint. We'll go and investigate it and, and take the appropriate action. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a motion for the noise bylaw as printed. Any further questions? All in favor? That's passed. Thanks, Aaron. I know you put a lot of work into that one, so thank, thank you, you for that. Um, lots of different uh, interests in the noise bylaw. Uh, 615, the proposed designation of 3 St. David Street and 4 Riverview Road concerning heritage. Councillor Riley, you had a uh, comment on that one? I'll move to, um, to receive the, uh, to receive it to start with. And basically that, um, that the Committee of the Whole endorsed, uh, not endorsed the whole uh, municipal heritage recommendation. At this time, I'm going to second or I'll speak to it. So that it be received that the Committee of the Whole not endorse the heritage recommendation to designate 3 St. David and 4 River Review in Lindsay under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act as being of cultural heritage value and interest yeah. and that that recommendation be brought forward to Council at the next Council meeting? Yes. Thank you. Get a seconder. Councillor Yo. thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I know, um, I've had lots of, uh, we said we have lots of, well, Councillor Dunn and I kind of share the same territory over there. I've had lots of, uh, uh, the, the, well, the actual petition has been taken up as well. But um, the, I think, believe there's been an excellent report that's come forward from our heritage person that basically took everything in consideration. I think this house, for example, was a house that has lots of heritage, but, you know, there's probably 200 or 300 of those heritage houses in Lindsay as well. This house wasn't, wasn't well kept up. 
uh, to start with, and this young woman that bought it basically added some new things to it. It was nothing to do with heritage. And um, I also uh, believe that, uh, and the other very important part is that I think we really need uh, housing in our community. So I think those are some of the key issues. And the other thing is they never really met the threshold of a lot of the things that it was supposed to meet to be uh, considered a, a heritage play, a heritage house. So uh, that's kind of the main reasons that uh, I would uh, say not recommend it. Thank you. Councillor Yeo, do you want to second it? Do you want to speak to it? I second <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Councillor Dunn, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of questions through you to the... There we are. Uh, my understanding is the Heritage Committee was approached at some time prior uh, when this question first came up and that they indicated that they had no interest from a heritage uh, standpoint in that particular property. Can you confirm or deny that? Um, I can neither confirm or deny that. I know, <laughs> to, be, to be perfectly honest, um, I know that the Heritage Committee was um, approached by members of the public who thought that there may be some heritage value. Um, and in getting this request from the public, members of the committee um, went and did some background research on the property, which ultimately informed their recommendation to council. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, my understanding is uh, this is the second kick at the, uh, at the can. You can't say kick at the cat anymore, so kick at the can for, um, <laughs> for uh, this particular piece of property. Um, the local residents have some very legitimate concerns uh, with this apartment building that the, um, uh, the, the planner and the developer are addressing. Um, you know, and I, I just get the feeling this is sort of a backdoor attempt to, uh, to shut down a, a, a perfectly legitimate development uh, that, that they just don't want. Uh, so I think I may argue against the development plan when it comes forward. I may not like it. And, and, Local people may not like it, but uh, I don't think this is the avenue to, uh, to shut it down. And I would uh, agree with those comments. Thank you. Councillor Ashmore, you had a comment? That's not relevant to this conversation. This is strictly just a heritage designation. So we're not referring it to the development process, the motion. Um, it's just whether this council chooses to designate it heritage or not, based on the recommendation. Okay, it was just sort of something that would help me make a decision, but okay, that's fine. Sorry. Any other questions, comments? Who, mo who moved it? Do you want to sum up, Councillor? I think it's all been said, and as uh, Councillor Dunn said before, I think the developer will see at the next stage. But I think the developer addressed some of the needs, in the, for example, and maybe no windows in the back, which will affect the people on King Street. So we'll give them more privacy. So um, well, that's all I need to say. Thank you. So the motion is not to designate it a municipal heritage as per the committee's recommendation. Just a point of order on the, on the actual motion. Is this not a negative motion so it should just be a straight receive? I'm just curious. I'm just trying to close it off. We could just receive it. I'm just trying to so that there's no we receive it, it's sort of left open. Um, I've just thought by putting in that we not endorse it, we're either endorsing it or we're not. So by moving to not endorse it, are we double, are we? We're good either way? All right. Uh, that was me, that was on me. I was the one that suggested put the not in. So uh, all in favor? That's passed, thank you. Um, 616 is a Kawartha Lakes Innovation Cluster Pilot Project proposal. Uh, Rebecca Mustard, uh, Rebecca's here, our Manager of Economic Development. It is moving forward on the Innovation Cluster as a pilot project. Um, do you want to, Councillor Yeo? I would move it as printed. As printed, second. Councillor Vale, um, any, want to speak to it? Any comments? Uh, just briefly, uh, um, I think it's a, it's, it's a good initiative. It, uh, Innovation cluster is something that's been uh, roaming around the city and the economic development for, for many, many years. So it's good to see something that, uh, call it a pilot project this far in the game, but uh, it's something we need and, and it's a good move. So I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Vail, do you want to speak to it? 
Um, no, it's just the same. It's a good project and, and it's uh, long overdue. Okay, any other questions? All in favor? That's passed, thank you. Um, Kawartha Lakes 617 is the Kawartha Lakes Small Business and Entrepreneurship Center, KLSBEC, program funding for 2019 to 2022. Uh, again, Rebecca's here if, if there's any questions. Um, we move forward with our funding program. Any Councillor Seymour Fagan, move it as printed. Second by Councillor O'Reilly. Do you want to speak to it? Councillor Elmsley? No? Okay. Any questions? Nobody wants to talk today. <laughs> I think this is great. I think it ties in with the, I'll talk, ties in with the innovation cluster. I mean, we were talking about it with the CAO earlier. It's, you know, you've got the small business which can start and then when they get to a certain point in their business uh, to have that innovation center where, you know, they can sort of progress. I think it's a great support, uh, tag team support that we can offer to some businesses moving forward. So if one of our priorities that we've talked about is, uh, is you know attracting business and, and growing business and keeping business in our community then i think these are a couple of a great ways to sort of add on to that so uh, uh thank you for those two reports uh, so as printed all in favor that's passed thank you uh 618 uh downtown reconstruction update uh corby's not here but mike's mike farquhar can juan's here okay sorry mike i just you know i thought i could put you on the spot so it's just an update to be received, uh, the reconstruction update for downtown, uh, be received that this recommendation be brought forward to council. Is there, somebody want to move it received? Councillor uh, O'Reilly and Vale. Is there any questions on the downtown update? Councillor O'Reilly. Um, we're going to, uh, as this rolls out, uh, we're going to, I presume, lots of communications we have up till now, because Kent Street, I'm sure, will be another, uh, it'll be probably the big one, and uh, it'll look forward to, um, you met with the, well, the BIA as well, Councillor Dunn and I are on that as well, so I'm sure there's more questions will arise, so uh, just uh, looking forward to, uh, it's got a busy, a busy year ahead. Do you have any comment on it, uh, one? Yeah. Just put your mic on, please. Uh, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. So yes, this is phase two of the downtown uh, reconstruction project. Uh, so phase one was Peel and Russell. Um, we are breaking up Kent Street into uh, two phases, over or proposed two phases, subject to budget approval. We'll be asking for an early start consideration at the regular council meeting of September 24th in order to get a tender out um, in November uh, with a projected start date of uh, February, March of next year, if approved. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have a quick question. The originally part of the talk last year, a couple of years ago, when you were doing your public meetings, was to to do all of Kent Street at one time. I know we reached out. Economic development was here, but we reached out to other communities that had done a downtown reconstruction, and one of the overwhelming response seemed to be that if you do it, do it all in one year, tie it up you know, make a mess for one year and get it over with as quick as possible. And I thought that's a direction that everybody seemed to be on board with. And now I see that we're staggering it over two or even three years, um, obviously from a, an affordability prospect. But what, what changed? What changed in that conversation? Can you update me? Uh, yes, uh, to you, Mr. Mayor. So at uh, PAC number two, which there's a link in the second page of the report uh, to all the background documents of that PIC, um, or maybe top of page three, uh, that's on the website. We had polled uh, the community uh, for two options. Option one is doing all of Kent Street in one year, and option two, doing half of Kent Street in one year, and the second half in the following year. Uh, so through the BAA, they conducted a, a survey of their membership, and more were in favor of splitting it up into a two-phase system. Um, now, not, it was by no means unanimous, uh, but the majority uh, was in favor of doing half in one year and half in the second year. Um, we did add a fourth phase, uh, not to Kent Street, to some of the side streets. Uh, we noticed when we're doing Peel and Russell, it was very, very challenging uh, to complete all the work in one calendar year. Peel is 95% complete. Russell is about halfway complete. Uh, and Kent Street is a bigger project. 
so knowing the realities of the construction world um, and the constraints on our funding, uh, we advise to break it up into four phases. Uh, but Kent Street still remains a two-phase project. Thank you. Uh, motion as printed to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. 619 is the, ah, there's Mike Farquhar. There's the update on projects within the road life cycle extension program uh, that the report uh, again be received. This, excuse me, gents, this comes from, uh, from the motion when we added seven, eight hundred thousand dollars to the road life cycle extension through our surplus and we asked that we brought back an update on the roads that were being added or worked on or, or where they were uh, at that time. So it's just an update to that. Uh, anything you want to add, Mr. Farquhar? Um. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, not unless there's any questions, uh, but just with the, uh, with the report, there's a chart which also updates uh, 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 a lot of other resolutions that came from that meeting as well that was outside that $800,000. So it just kind of ties everything together. So some of the other roads that were brought up but aren't funded as part of that life cycle extension are in this report saying they'll be under consideration a lot of them in 2020. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, that is correct. Perfect. Uh, did you have something to add, Juan? Uh, just wanted to um, highlight that. Uh, page two of this report is very important. Uh, it's the June 11th, 2019 special council meeting where there was over 30 resolutions. So these at least address them all. Uh, and then there's more information or more discussion to have either in decision units or in the 2020 capital approval that will then massage the uh, consideration 2020 column in that report. So this is, I think, a key document to refer to in the uh, upcoming months. Thank you. So we'll get a motion as printed. Councillor Almsley? Okay, it's just to receive. So are you okay with that? And Councillor Yo, you'll second it. I know you have a question as well. Just to receive, go ahead. When we use the term, will be considered in the 2020 budget, does that mean it will be in the 2020 budget or you're gonna have a conversation about it and it may not appear there? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, it'd be included as a decision unit. It will be a decision unit. That is correct. Thank you. Councilor Yo. Yeah, thank you, my uh, question stems from the rationale and it says as the work progresses, engineering will be able to ascertain the extent of additional road sections that can be added for completion this year based on weather conditions. <coughs> and I just want to take this opportunity to inform staff that um, City Road 41, which is on the list, it's nothing new, but it is, um, it is becoming a very serious safety hazard. So, and it is, it's, it's worse than baseline was. Just for a small section north of Bexley, so just for, uh, if there is any money left for a couple of smears, that's all it requires. They've done a couple this year, but they ran out of money in public works, so thank you. Thank you, Councilor Riley. Just through to Mike or one, what is the probability great that you're going to be able to get an opportunity with the fall being this you know, typical fall, hopefully that you'll get them, get them done this fall? I know you don't have a... <laughs> Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we'll just continue. Say yeah, just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best based on weather conditions, but uh, that, that is the plan. That is the plan. Right now, we're finishing up our current contract on Avery Point, and then we're going to Lake Del Rimple for that. That would be the balance of our current road resurfacing um, contract. After that, then we're, we're making our way south. So we'll hit Brecon and then over to uh, Cobaconk Baseline uh, and work our way south as long as we can. Anything that doesn't get, sorry, anything that doesn't get finished up in the fall, if we get an early winter, will be completed in the spring. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, there'll be carry. If, if we don't get finished this fall, there'll be carry over in the spring, and then we'll commence once as soon as possible in the spring. Perfect. Thank you. Councillor Ashmore, you had a question? You want to put your microphone on, please? I just wanted to, just a question on one of them uh, for the next year, just a consideration. Just uh, Shamrock Road, I was bringing that up there, just in one spot, whether that could be uh, hot smeared next year, possibility be considered. That'd be um, a question for the 2020, bu 2020, 2020 yeah. budget. This is yeah. really just an update on this year. So okay, that's fine. Uh, make a note of that, bring, bring it up at budget discussions, and uh, I'm sure Mr. Farquhar will be there. Yep. Perfect. Uh, Juan, you had your button pushed. Did you have something to add? 
Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, just to, uh, I just, you, you mentioned it already, but just to highlight that our capital close policy allows uh, six months into the following year. So we have until June of 2020 to complete this works uh, without asking for an extension. Any work that hasn't been completed will go through the financial capital close and request an extension if required. Yes, and just a reminder that we added these to the road because the roads are in terrible, you know, some of them are, are in dire straits. So obviously the, the need is as immediate as possible, but I think we understand that there's conditions beyond everybody's control. So it's not gonna rain from now till December, so you should be good to go. All right, any further questions on the update? All in favor? <laughs> it's raining right now, after that passes. After today. after today, it's never gonna rain, sorry. <laughs> There goes my credibility. Sorry? Perfect, yeah. You can see where that'll get you. Uh, thanks for that update, uh, Mike. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, 6110 is the roads fee for service review. Uh, David McPherson is here, uh, manager of roads operations. This is regarding the winter maintenance fee for service review. Uh, this is the one Councillor Yo requested. Uh, bring it back, I guess, wear it makes sense in in quotes um and the motion brought forward is is to receive with the rationale uh, in the report uh mr mcpherson's here if there's any questions does anybody want to move it as printed councillor o'reilly as printed second councillor richardson you want to speak to it councillor richardson any questions for mr mcpherson councillor yo you had a question go ahead sorry There we go. I see there wasn't a lot of uptake from council on this, so not a lot of sense going around there. I had a couple of roads, a couple of mine were taken off because um, they made so much sense that staff said, yeah, we'll do that one. So, but, but there's one road on here, um, McGuire's Beach Road, and I'd asked for a family that would be included for a fee for service, and if they'll take it, we can vote on it, and, and just um, council can make a decision on whether to allow it. It does meet the minimum standard. It is so close to being an assumed road, all it needs is for them to actually do a little bit of work and apply for it. Um, but they, they have had a fee for service in the past. They, uh, they had problems one year paying for that. They have given me their word that there will be no problem paying in the future. And they've been here a few times arguing that point. And so I'd like just like to give it up to council and give them a chance to vote on once and for all and say yes or no. So I wonder if you take that as a friendly, whoever moved it. Yeah. Okay. So that Mag so that it be received at McGuire's Beach Road. Can you add to that? If we're gonna go that route, which I will not support, but if you're gonna go that route, uh, that it be at market rate. Absolutely. At the market rate or yep. cost recovery rate, yep. if if as part of it. Just to be clear on that. So you'll accept that, Councillor Richardson. You seconded it. Are you okay with that? You are okay. Do you wanna? Question of the of the councilor here: um, is, is the road good enough for our equipment to get in? I guess would be one of the questions. Yes. Yes, we used to do it. Yeah, I didn't realize that, but it just we got bigger equipment now. That's all the trucks and all that stuff. But, okay. Do you want to comment on that, David? Or no, the 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 road has been serviced in the past. Thank you, Councillor Ashmore. You had a question. Microphone, please. With respect to Elder Street, um, it mentions here that the laneway is not large enough for municipal equipment. However, uh, I, th I believe about 10 years ago, talking to them, there was a limited service agreement and a half-ton truck, the contractor that does that area, he, he was able to get to the very end and turn around. So I'm just wondering, Elder Street, um, <coughs> is that totally off the list or is that uh, something that could be? added to it, like it, there, at one time there was a limited service agreement right to the very, very end of it. Elder Street's in Kennedy Bay, it's the very, very, very far end, past Kennedy Bay Road and then it goes to Elder Street and then this is the very far end of Elder Street, but there are some folks that live there. So I, maybe I can talk to you there. Yeah, well, let's get David first. Throw it here. Yeah, put your microphone on, please, yep. Please. There. I defer to my director through the mayor. I like him. He's good. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, 
Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I, I'm not aware of the history of the maintenance of that road, but in reviewing the, the conditions of the road and current status of that road, it is, uh, it is a very narrow uh, road, uh, not serviceable by municipal equipment, does not meet any kind of minimum standard within the road. So again, our recommendation is not to provide service to that road or the other ones identified. Uh, McGuire Beach Road, again, has a, a history of uh, a service, a history of non-payment. The, the service was ceased uh, due to that uh, history. Uh, we've been working very proactively with that group to have the road uh, brought to a municipal standard and assumed and working with that, uh, the group. And that's where my recommendation as the director is to continue to work with that group to have the road assumed and not reinstate a fee-for-service basis because we're in the process of, uh, of uh, ceasing those services uh, across the municipality. So Elder Road, your reasoning is that the road, the portion there you're talking about that's not maintained is not suitable for our equipment at this time? Uh, uh, correct. You have a follow-up question, Councillor Ashmore? To the director, um, Cobble Lane. It says here fee for service is not recommended. So there, are there, what are the options for Cobble Lane? Is there any way, I mean, it is really a, a difficult roadway to get for the people to get in there and there's a few people that live down there and they pay significant taxes as well so I mean they're certainly willing to to look at this but are we writing it off that we cannot have a fee for service at the end of this road cobble lane so uh, again uh, through you mr. mayor to uh, councillor cobble lane is a private road uh, council has provided us direction not to undertake any new limited service agreements for private roads so it's against a prior resolution uh, in addition to that, is uh, it's a substandard road that doesn't meet minimum standards for, for providing service. Uh, they have options. Uh, they, if they choose to bring a road uh, and undertake the road up to a construction or improvements on the road to bring it to uh, minimum standards, they can apply to have the road assumed by the municipality and, and commence service. Uh, again, the cost would be to the residents, uh, by the residents, so uh, there would be uh, impact to them. So they have alternatives. Uh, but as it stands right now with uh, the resolution of council not to provide service to additional private roads and the condition of that road there's no alternative for municipal servicing in our mind thank you councillor almsley had a question no mr mayor i have a comment my comment is i'm not supporting this motion and i'm not supporting any future motion to remove any more roads from service regardless of ownership or anything else it seems like every other week i hear about another road that's removed we're not going to do this we're not going to do that we're not going to do this for this reason and i'm not having it anymore i'm not supporting <coughs> any more roads being removed from service none of the roads on this report are being removed from service uh, none of them are receiving service as of right now so, so they were all requested to be added correct so through you mr mayor these roads do not receive municipal service at this time uh, nor have they in recent history, uh, with the exception of McGuire Beach about four years ago or three years ago. Um, so, uh, yeah, these are not removals or decreasing level of service. These were requested to be increased the level of service. Well, I think that McGuire's did receive service, and I think Councillor Ashmore had one that received service some time ago that's no longer receiving service. I, sorry, can't do it. Thank you. Do you want to sum up, Councillor Riley? All been said. Uh, everybody's clear on the motion? All in favor? Hands up, please. One, two, three, four, five. Motion passes. Okay. Um, six, one, where are we? Six, one, ten, rows. Six, one, eleven is the requirement to connect to municipal services review. Rob, Mc, Rob McPherson, water and wastewater technician. Amber's here. Uh, requirement connect, this is the mandatory connect. Councilor Dunn, this was your baby. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll move the, that it be received and that option or alternative number one be brought forward to council for consideration at the September 24th meeting. If I get a second, I'll explain it. So let's see what option number one is. Can you clarify? Where is it? Yeah, I was just waiting for a seconder before I did. Okay, so okay. let's, you'll, so move by yourself, second by Councillor Yo. Yes? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, if you read the report, and I had to read it a couple times actually to figure it out. The recommendation is status quo. And if we pass the motion the way it's written, it would be status quo. 
Uh, my favorite motion, uh, position, of course, is al alternative number two, which uh, isn't very palatable to council. So this one here is you hook up when, when your system fails and you don't have to pay until, uh, until such time. So you still have to hook up, mandatory hookup is still there, but you're not required to pay the minimum fees until such time as the, um, as the uh, failure occurs. Thank you. Councilor Yo, do you want to speak to it? No. Was that a no? Yeah. Okay. Um, Councilor Ashmore, you had your button pushed. Did you have a question or? You're good. Any other questions, comments, Councilor Riley? Um, I think I think I support the motion because I think we've kind of come to middle ground on this sort of thing. The only challenge is that the people that have already uh, uh, that are already have uh, paid, and some other people aren't going to pay till uh, you know they've been paying all along, and then yeah, yeah, I realize that, but uh, that's just be my comment. Well, 133 of the 134 are paying, so uh, I'm not going to support the motion. I I think. They should be paying something as a fixed cost. I would support some kind of compromise between, you know, what they're paying now, which is the 350, roughly 700, if they have both services, some kind of fixed cost that's a compromise between that and zero. Uh, I don't agree with, uh, you know, with them not having to pay for infrastructure that they have access to. So um, I won't support the motion. Count Chomsley, you had a question? No, more of a statement that. I think we can have this argument at council because I agree with you. I think that uh, some nominal fee for the service would be fitting somewhere between what we're collecting now and uh, what would be a, uh, a reasonable fee well, for We can, we can have the argument here. We don't have to wait till council. We don't have to support the well, motion. My argument, my argument would be that maybe uh, that uh, the fee be capped at $50 a quarter for water and $50 a quarter for wastewater, which would, if you had both services, that would make it $400 a year. If you had only one service, it would be $200 a year. And I, I don't know if I can put that forward as a friendly or uh, uh, make it a motion afterwards. I'm seeing no. Um, he's going to, not at this time, but we can, you know, I, I agree with your, I would agree with that as a follow-up if this fails. But let's, right now the motion on the floor is to keep the mandatory connect but not pay the, the fixed costs until your service fails. And then yeah, the only problem I have with that is to do it as a follow-up. It's a contradictory motion, is it not? Not a follow-up. If this motion fails, then you can put forward your motion. Okay. This is the recommendation. <coughs> So it's not it, going to be a friendly. It's not going to be a friendly. Okay. Councillor Dunn's not being very friendly today. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, comments on the current motion? Do you want to sum up? Yeah, we're going to get right back to the, or, the original argument. Uh, Fenlon Falls, um, all that road up there has, um, has a utility that maybe uh, improves their, the value of the property. Maybe it doesn't. If you want natural gas, then yes, it improves the value of your property. Just because uh, we have the powers to make law arbitrarily doesn't mean we should make law ar arbitrarily. Natural gas can't force everybody on that line to hook up to natural gas or pay the fee. Uh, neither should we force everybody that happens to be on a line pay the fee. Uh, if in fact at such time, we've already got the mandatory hookup, so they got to hook up. Natural gas doesn't get that option either, by the way. When your furnace fails, you don't get the option. But we at least put that option in there. And that's why I say it's not my favorite option, but it is a compromise. Um, uh, you should be forced to pay for something you neither want nor receive. And it's a bad law that, uh, to, uh, to leave that in there at a nickel a year. What's wrong is wrong, and I think you should support this motion. Thank you. Is everybody clear on the motion? Call the question. All in favor? Not in a committee of uh, uh, committee of the whole. All in favor? Motion fails. Do you want to do a follow-up, Councillor Elmsley? Yep. I'll, the motion will be with option one as printed, and that there be a a maximum fee of fifty dollars a quarter for water and wastewater on the on the. Uh, 
connection uh, on the pipes running in front? What, yeah, what are we calling yeah, it? We can figure out the wording, but I think, <laughs> is there some way that you need that worded for clarification or are we, go ahead. Uh, sorry, three years Mr. Mayor, the, the wording would be pretty straightforward. Is it $50 uh, per service available for eligible or qualifying homes under the bylaw? Per quarter, per quarter, per quarter, correct? Okay, anybody want to second that? Councillor Yo? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I need some enthusiasm, but yeah, okay. You'll second it. Um, do you want to speak to it, Councillor Helmsley? You did, or do you want to? No, I think, I think it makes sense that uh, uh, despite Councillor Dunn's persuasive argument about natural gas and other things, natural gas gets their money back in other ways, like through provincial subsidies and, and some other things. Um, and I think that there is a rationale that we have to maintain those pipes on, on a regular basis and there is um, fire hydrants in the areas and, and they need to be maintained. So I think something being collected in, in this area and not the full nut uh, makes sense. And I agree with your argument. Uh, Councillor Yo, do you want to uh, comment? Um, yeah, briefly. Um, I agree with Councillor Dunn, um, but if, if we can get it down to a, a nominal fee that is proposed now, I could, I could live with that. I know the people I represent in Norland could live with that uh, a lot easier than they could live with the charges now. So I will support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dunn? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Question through you to the whichever director wants to handle it. What's the current uh, mandatory? Uh, what's the current mandatory fee on a quarterly basis? Give me a second. It's okay. Uh, I can tell you. It's in it's here. Okay. It's uh, fixed. Water service is three sixty six seventy two per quarter, and sewer service is three fifty four seventy two per quarter. No, no, no. So we. That's per year. Per year. Per year. That's per year. Sorry, that's per year. So it's seven, about seven, about seven fifty. So we're going to knock twenty bucks off. Is that what we're saying? No, nope. seven fifty for the year, and he's proposing fifty a quarter for a full service is down to four hundred. So it's almost half, almost half of what's currently being charged. Seven fifty per year, and we're going to, and he's proposing we drop it down to four hundred per year. Correct. If you have both services, for, for water nothing. and wastewater. Okay. All right. Uh, I uh, I don't understand the process. I, like like I, like I really don't. Um, people are getting nothing. That they you know they ask for nothing. They're getting nothing. Uh, I'll be making the same argument, obviously, at, uh, at council. I'll, at that point, I'll ask for a recorded vote, obviously. Um, this is just simple abuse of power. We're taking our power to take money out of people's pockets without giving them anything in return. And if anybody was doing that to you, you would object, and so you should. This is 33 cents per user right now. So we're not, saving, we're not saving the water people, the people that are paying water bills a whole bunch of money. This is $4 a year, 33 cents per month is what we're saving me as a, as a water payer. It's simply not right. And I hope you don't support this motion either. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I certainly don't agree with those comments at all. Do you want to sum, sum up, Councillor Wright? Did you move it? Sorry, Councillor Holmesley, do you want to sum up? You did? So call the question. Everybody's clear on the motion? All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Um, 6112 is wastewater effluent monitoring. Uh, this was a memo I brought forward to see if there was some rationale in, obviously, in wasting Amber's time. <laughs> and I'm sorry I did that, Amber. Um, I just had a, a question from some... Uh, some uh, businesses that were not putting as much water back into the system as or they claimed that they were taking out but they were being billed accordingly so we just wanted to explore uh, that was a, a, a memo that that council approved 
uh, the motion is just to receive and not change anything. And based on the information, I agree with the uh, with the report. So, you'll move that, Councillor O'Reilly, seconded by Councillor Seymour Fagan. Any questions, comments? All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Thank you for doing that uh, report. Appreciate it. Um, we have no correspondence. We don't need to go into closed. Uh, I just need a motion to adjourn, please. Councillor Yo, seconded by Councillor Dunn. All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you.